100,000 subscribers is a milestone that my channel just recently passed. Now, I can't believe I've gotten this far on YouTube. A silver play button is something I've dreamed about since I was a kid, and I am so grateful to everyone who has watched my videos and supported me. I can't thank you enough. However, one of the reasons that I even started making stuff online is because I watch a lot of stuff online. I have been watching videos on this website since I was 12. It has been my primary source of entertainment for over a decade now, and I've easily spent 10 times more hours watching YouTube than watching TV or movies or anime. I learned from and was inspired by so many other channels growing up that I attribute most of my success to them. So to try and do justice to all of the amazing creators on this platform that I've watched over the years, I want to focus on some that I think deserve your attention. Here are 100 YouTubers under 100,000 subscribers that I think you should watch. The way it works, because this is a gigantic video and I feel like it needs some explanation, is that I'll be roughly going through all 100 YouTubers and talking about what they make, why I like them, and what video I think you should start with. The intent being to paint enough of a picture of them that if they seem interesting to you, you can go watch that video and subscribe to them. All their channels will be numbered and linked in the description to make everything easy to find, Though I should say that the order is pretty much arbitrary and just because one channel is higher than another doesn't mean I think they're better. The recommended video for each channel will then be in one giant playlist in the description in order of appearance. That's about as simple as I can make things, hopefully it works. And finally, two disclaimers. One, you may think that 100 YouTubers is a lot, and it is, but it is nowhere near the tip of the goddamn iceberg. For proof of that, there is a spreadsheet linked in the description that actually has over 400 YouTubers in it that I wanted to talk about before having to pick only 100 to put in the final video. As much as I wanted to cover everyone, I know that that wasn't feasible. This video took long enough as it is, so I will just link that spreadsheet and apologize in advance to anyone that I missed. Two, I have done more groundwork for this video than most projects I've worked on in my life. Check the spreadsheet for proof of that. However, I'm not doing some deep background check on everyone I'm talking about here. I wish I could even reach out to everyone I mentioned, but some don't even have social media. So with 100 YouTubers, it is statistically likely that one of them will be canceled. So if you check out a channel and see that they're in jail or something, whoops. Oh, and if you're a YouTuber mentioned in this video and don't want to be, send me an email or something and I should be able to cut you out. All jokes aside, I do want only positivity going towards everyone mentioned here. If a creator isn't for you, just move on to the next one. I'm sure you'll find something you like. But if you do find a new favorite, feel free to leave a comment about them to let other people know. Anyways, with all that out of the way, let's get started. Now, picking a first channel is a bit tricky because I know due to the nature of lists and YouTube videos, they will get the most eyes on them. I can't help that. What I can do is just recommend a really small channel that I think might get a big bump from that. Namely, the channel MSC836. This seemingly random string of letters and numbers is a video essay channel focused on cinematic language, particularly in anime. In their videos, they showcase and dissect the different visual patterns of things like Evangelion, Gridman, and Dinazanon, all without speaking a single word. Their videos are communicated entirely through on-screen text, minimalist lines and graphics, and the occasional subtitle. Take their first video, Neon Genesis Evangelion, visually divided. In it, they go through the entirety of Ava and show how the series is able to communicate its central themes through a liberal use of divided shot compositions, with the build-up all the way to their final point going over what I think is literally every example of one of these shots that appears in the entire show. It is incredibly thorough, and it is captivating to watch. Like all their videos, it has a quality to it that just keeps my eyes glued to the screen. If videos with a voice in them are more your speed though, maybe even a face perhaps, then boy do I have the channel for you. 
Tim, or Tim as I like to call them, puts out these insanely high production video game retrospective videos. And I mean high production. Their videos are structured as these dives into various video games, going into their history and Tim's personal experience playing them, which is insightful and very entertaining on its own. But the effort that goes into the making of these videos is what blows me away. This is straight up movie quality, or at the very least a million subscriber channel with a full team behind it quality. My favorite video of theirs, and one of the first ones I watched, was Black, a car game about guns. It follows the titular game, Black, a first person shooter on the PS2 made by the people who made Burnout, covering the game's development, backstory, and ultimate lack of success. And I feel like it's a pretty straightforward watch that'll get you hooked on Tim's style. In 2006, a little British studio by the name of Criterion released the greatest first person shooter of all time. But it didn't start there, it started a few years before. It started with some goddamn mindless PlayStation car crash video game. It started with Burnout. If you can see it, you can shoot it. Words immortalized by Another channel with a good amount of filmmaking chops, and someone who actually talks about films quite regularly, is Caleb Gammon. He's the premier channel for all of your Caleb Gammon type content. Content that focuses on movies, games, the stagnation of global industry as it hurdles toward a failing technocratic dystopia, uh, ranking every Star Wars movie, <laughs> your, your typical stuff. I will say Caleb Gammon is one of the few channels here that I really can't pin down to a specific niche. The videos are all discussions of various bits of media or culture that they pick apart and make jokes about while also providing genuinely insightful commentary. And even if a topic is something I would have no interest in normally, I am sitting down and watching Caleb Gammon's video on it. My favorite series from Caleb Gammon is called Cybergunk, which is a whole discussion about how all this new technology like AI basically doesn't work at all. Though for a first video, I'd actually recommend How Lord of the Rings Screwed New Zealand, because it's a pretty straightforward examination of the New Zealand film industry. Now, without rights anymore, all screen production labor in New Zealand has been devalued. Movies, TV, games, actors, visual effects, composers, if your work is in any way related to screen entertainment, get fucked while well, simultaneously this influx of government money is ensuring that this industry grows and moving on from one channel with a great name to another we have shoes in the dryer shoes is a channel focused on a lot of things but particularly music having made some great videos about bare naked ladies weezer and a japanese soap opera about printers Okay, you see, the way Shoes talks about media is honestly so thoughtful and compelling that I'm 100% faithful that they can make that an all-time classic. When Shinyoji first goes into his boss's office, he's being shown on the TV in his office with that shot somehow following him as he moves. But like, n no camera is visible. No cameraman is visible. And also like, why? Why does he need a TV in his office to show him who's in his office? If he can see the TV, then he's in his office. So he can see all this himself. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's a good video. I mean, it was posted the same day I wrote this section, and I literally just stopped what I was doing to watch the entire thing. Very few YouTubers can get me invested like that. But while their Japanese soap opera video is honestly fantastic, my favorite video of theirs is also a lot of people's favorites since it's sort of blown up. That being an easy intro to Japanese music, which is pretty self-explanatory. It goes into the history and influence of a lot of different bands that all serve as a good way to get into music from Japan. And alongside that great premise that got me interested, the video itself is super fun to watch, even if you have no interest in the subject. I like my jazz the way I like my 1947 Tom and Jerry animated short, The Cat Concerto, with a lot of piano in it. Going on a bit of a music-focused tangent here, we have another creator that actually makes some themselves, Gino7. And to explain what their channel is about, well, I'll let Gino do the talking. White guy making six to twenty-seven minute videos about increasingly esoteric obsession. Put an original concept, the original concept, no one's ever done it before. Put an original concept, the original concept, no one's ever done it before. 
Gino's videos are these incredibly relaxing lo-fi twists on your typical dude talking about media type videos. They somehow give me the exact same feeling of stumbling upon an old show I used to like as a kid and just losing myself in a binge watch. Except instead of being an old show, they tend to talk about old stuff. Stuff like Cartoon Network sound designers, the entire audio production of Wario Land 4, and some very fun and relatively obscure movies. With their style of commentary being something I could listen to forever. Easily my favorite video of Geno's is their Bands That Sound Like Queen Multiverse, which just goes through a ton of different bands that sound like Queen and kind of builds up the reason that Queen has such a unique sound in the first place. Not only is it a good video, but like the last one I recommended, it gave me a ton of new music to listen to, which is always a bonus. In the 80s, Sparks did a great run of new wave albums, and it's here that Russell Mail would start to go apeshit with his vocal harmony overdubbing. Where's my girl? This probably isn't a coincidence, because it was around this point in their careers that Sparks and Queen were actually sharing a producer in Reinhold Mack. In fact, I think this is him in the background of Queen's One Vision featurette wearing a Sparks t-shirt. Nice. Pivoting away from people with amazing audio chops back to some of the most insane visuals I've seen on the platform, we have Funebure. I actually feel torn on recommending this channel, not because they don't deserve it, in fact I think they deserve all the success in the world, but because being subscribed to a creator this talented with less than a thousand subs makes me kinda wanna gatekeep them. I found Funebere first, I subscribed to them before it was cool. But because I'm such a nice guy, I'll share them with you. Because they make some of the greatest looking mixed media animations talking about anime, manga, and like a lot of hentai. Like mostly hentai if I'm being honest. They're a self-proclaimed connoisseur of degeneracy, and their video topics are all over the place. They're just a vibe, really. If you want to watch the most well-put-together discussions of horror hentai rule 34 or various attractive fictional characters, you'll like what they make. And even if you don't like the topic, you'll be blown away by the editing. My favorite video of theirs is Collector, which is this dive into physical anime media and the highs and lows of collecting it. Going into various surprisingly specific rants about everything to do with DVD covers and art books and such, it's very fun and I have no idea how much work it must have taken to make. So what's the deal with Weevil Physical Media and all that stuff? Am I hungry for answers or could this just be an excuse to complain about things that drives me nuts? No. I don't know, who can tell? Why don't we find out? Hopeless. So last year, while rewatching some good old classics, I tried putting on my legal copy of Back Up to Test, but suddenly the inconveniences started piling up even more rapidly than any watch later list you could have. Going so even found... further into animation focused creators, we have someone who literally just makes their own anime, Moondoggy. I honestly don't know how to describe these videos other than saying they're anime. It's crazy, they just make anime. These videos are so goddamn beautiful. The structure of them is generally similar to your typical sort of story time content, talking about the joys of collectible trading cards, the trouble with enjoying new movies, the anxiety of wanting to live in the moment, except animated like goddamn feature films. I cannot get over how good it looks. And again, them having only 7,000 subscribers makes me angry. Every video of theirs has this incredibly relatable and personal message to it. I mean, the titles alone should let you know what you're getting into here. They're amazing. My favorite video of theirs is hard to pick, but It's Not Goodbye, It's Never Goodbye is a great one to start with. It's a personal story about Moondoggy's relationship with the Yu-Gi-Oh card game, going into their childhood spent playing it and how it affected them going forward. As someone who was equally obsessed with Yu-Gi-Oh as a kid, it hit kinda hard. So I, uh, <laughs> oh, this is so lame. I built a spare deck and I taught my mum how to play, which was actually really nice. My mum was insanely busy with work all the time growing up, so getting to sit down and just spend half an hour with her a few nights a week was really comforting as a shy 11 year old. And that's exactly what I think Takahashi wanted Yu-Gi-Oh to be about. And finally, to wrap up the first 10 channels in this video that 
I'm now realizing might be the biggest project I've ever worked on, I actually have three recommendations that I feel work quite well together. Those being Pause and Select, The Cynic Clinic, and Study of Swords. These are three absolute geniuses when it comes to talking about Japanese media and culture, all three of them dissecting anime and various topics related to it in a way that's both entertaining and informative. Starting off with The Cynic Clinic, who is, in my opinion, the most straightforward of the trio, and definitely the most Australian, he makes a lot of very quick and concise discussions about things like the history of the term anime, the real reason anime lip flaps look like that, and why every show has a school roof scene in it for some reason. The way that Cynic Clinic paces out their videos and presents the information in them makes them so fun to binge through. They're very charismatic and funny, even when going over more deep cut research topics, which makes them honestly ideal to watch for anyone who tends to zone out at the thought of educational content. These videos aren't really in that video essay space so much as they feel like your cool English teacher being real with you for a second. My favorite video of theirs is Trigun is mostly filler, that's why it's brilliant which, as you probably guessed, goes over anime filler episodes and how a lot of people tend to think about them in the wrong way. It personally changed my opinion on the subject at least, and at 8 minutes long there's no good reason someone into anime shouldn't check it out. I think anime and manga fans sometimes don't realize exactly how good they've got it when it comes to adaptation. There's basically nothing else in the world that consistently interprets mediums with the same level of faithful and accurate portrayals of stories, as manga to anime adaptations. Consider the general accuracy of a book to a movie, or a comic book to a cartoon. Even the best of them tend to pale in comparison to the exact panel for cut translations that are taken for granted in the Japanese pipeline. And if the Cynic Clinic feels like a cool teacher, then Pause and Select absolutely has the vibes of like a tenured college professor. You know, the one you can ask literally anything after class and they'll happily start a 20 minute conversation with you that goes over more research on the topic than you were aware even existed. Every one of Paz's videos are masterclasses in education and explanation. I wouldn't even call them video essays so much as video research papers. Which is only partially a joke because Paz has published actual research papers and their videos regularly include interviews with published scholars anyway. Anime, manga, and religiosity in Japan, AMVs and transformative storytelling, sweetness and lightning's counter-hegemonic masculinity. These are all incredibly interesting dives into topics that most anime fans probably haven't thought that much about. But watch any of these videos and I can guarantee you're going to come away with a new appreciation for all of them. Or at the very least, you're going to have a good time watching the pretty visuals Pause and Select puts on screen. A video I would highly recommend you start out with is Katakawa Haruhi and how they shape the world of the media mix. It goes into the media mix, this way that Japanese media in particular loves to spread stories out across different mediums, and Pause explains it with the help of Mark Steinberg, an author of a book all about the subject. It's fascinating to watch, it's something I think pretty much anyone who's actually into anime is going to find insightful, and it's a part one, so if you like the video you can just move on to the next one afterwards. And this is really interesting. We oftentimes think of stories like they're self-contained, that we can read them from front to back and boom, we're done. But think about this. What if stories aren't necessarily standalone pieces, but more so they're a different kind of piece, pieces of a puzzle. And in this puzzle, we can sort of peer into a world with some fascinating consequences. Rounding out the 10th channel then is Study of Swords, who you may be familiar with if you've seen my video on anime fan service because I directly shouted them out in that video, and who you definitely should become familiar with if you enjoy deeper discussions of media. Swords is another academic of all things anime. Or not just anime, because they've covered video games and postmodernism and swords, but I like the alliteration so I'm going to go with that. Really, there's a reason why I included them in the trio with Cineclitic and Pause and Select, because they are fantastic at diving into an anime-related topic and coming out the other side with a video about it that completely changes my perspective on the matter. Their video series on Kill a Kill in particular is probably the single reason I started to take my discussions of anime more seriously, so honestly without that I probably wouldn't have even found like half the other channels on this list. Though without a doubt the video I'd recommend from them is You Are Wrong About Deconstruction, 
which is this 40 minute dissection of that tired old saying, oh, this anime is actually a deconstruction of the genre, where Swords goes through basically everything related to the idea of deconstructions in order to explain why that's just not true. It's absolutely great. Highly recommend you check it out. The TV Tropes entry for Deconstruction was published in April of 2007, so now you know what the source of that first red spike was. This is important for two reasons. The first is that it is my contention that, more than any other source, TV Tropes is uniquely responsible for the pop cultural conceptualization of deconstruction or genre deconstruction. Getting out of the anime analysis niche for a second, I'm gonna hard pivot to the furthest thing I can think of. Mia Cole, who makes... Uh, the internet has corrupted a whole generation of the population the and will continue to do so for generations to to come, and I get you're seeping into every single level of involuntary celibacy. I'm sorry. No idea what that is, but if I had to, which I do, I'd describe Mia's brand of content as feature-length indie films disguised as YouTube commentary videos that got dunked into whatever chemicals turned Jack Nicholson into the Joker. If you're terminally online, you've committed Twitter sins like I have, or you're just really interested in the existential horror of creating content online, you're gonna love Mia's videos. They cover the many problems of the internet age through these incredibly personal and heartfelt discussions of Mia's relationship with each subject, where she will somehow eloquently break down a complex topic while ironically shitposting the entire time. It's great, I have no other words to describe it. My favorite video of hers is obviously Scooby-Doo is an incel and here's why, but that one's maybe a little too much for most people, so instead I'll recommend Twitter Sins, which is a breakdown of the many problems Mia has with the platform. I'd say it's her best video yet, definitely her magnum opus. Also I'm in it, but that's unrelated, I just think it's a good video. So, why is Twitter the way that it is? And by Twitter, I do mean not Twitter. Elon Musk, in an act of allyship with the non-binary community, changed the name of Twitter to x.com. I'm still gonna call it Twitter though, cause I'm not a sheep. Uh, Twitter? I think you mean X? <laughs> I'll kill you. Back into the swing of things, these next seven channels all have some very chill video game related content. First is Pretzel, who primarily makes a series called Video Game World Tours. In it, they'll check out some fun details all across the maps of games like Starfield, Zelda, and Half-Life, often pointing out those small cubbies that don't really serve a purpose, or the parts the player doesn't have access to, and kind of showing how the sausage is made. These videos do an absolutely fantastic job at showcasing these worlds and letting you feel the atmosphere in them. It can be really hard to show the vibes of certain video games through YouTube, but Pretzel's narration, background sound mixing, and slow, methodic pace do a great job, which also makes these videos supremely relaxing to watch. My favorite video of theirs is also their most popular, at over a million views so far, the Strange Maps of Gary's Mod. It goes through all the nooks and crannies of the default maps of the game, which was something I grew up playing, and the nostalgia is absolutely real in this video. I'd highly recommend checking it out. RP servers are their own little societies. And you can see how the map designers here encourage that playstyle. This is obviously intended to be a jail. And these are the affordable apartments. There's something pure about everyone deciding to play along and pretend like they're renting out little apartments. Much like Construct, this is a map brimming with spots to build in. So many rooms and buildings to inspire you to decorate them in a certain way. It's all very dense. Speaking of cozy vibes, you then have Kiro Talks, who makes very short, very to-the-point gaming videos. Joke characters in video games, cooking in video games, malls in video games, regional changes for video game box art. I don't know if I could describe what these videos are about more concisely than their titles already do. Most of Kiro's videos just go over the topic at hand, bringing up a bunch of different examples to explore and sometimes poke fun at. I love how many videos they have out there because it means you can just scroll through their catalog until a topic catches your eye, or just binge watch all of them because they are super consistent in their presentation with a really laid back feel that reminds me of classic YouTube while carrying its own style. My favorite video of theirs is video game age ratings, because it goes over some different kinds of rating systems I genuinely wasn't aware of. It's a fun topic to show off Kiro's style, I'm sure you'll love it. Video game rating systems allow retailers to stop kids from getting access to mature games without the AOK -okay from a parent or guardian first. Depending on the country, 
These rating systems are either a hard rule that stores must follow or they're basically just suggestions. The rating system used by the US and Canada is the Entertainment Software Rating Board, aka the ESRB. They were created in 1994 after a ton of controversies related to violence in video games. Some of the main targets of controversy being Mortal Kombat, Night Trap, Lethal Enforcers, and Doom. And out there making videos after my own heart is kind of Brad at this, who makes stuff talking about live service games, gaming price tags, and Dishonored. Really, if you want me to like your channel, just talk about Dishonored. It's an easy way to win me over. But great topics aside, Brad makes really fun and fast-paced videos about various gaming topics, both serious and silly. Though, mostly silly. <laughs> All their videos have a fun, your buddy telling you about some topic they find interesting and trying to get you to laugh energy that I go for in my own stuff a lot of the time. And these videos have genuinely made me laugh, sometimes with just the title. The video I'd recommend from them though is one of their more recent uploads, Video Game Ads Used to Be Insane. It's a fun look at those old, cursed 90s and 2000s advertisements, and it has some of my favorite bits Brad has made so far. Honestly, they were just pretty clever, like the series for the GameCube where each launch title was given its own cube showing off what the game felt like. Pikmin were trapped in this cute little dirt cube. Star Wars Rogue Leader got this sick action shot as if there was a war going on right inside of the cube and Luigi's Mansion kidnapped this kid and Smash Bros? It was gonna break every bone in your pathetic little body. This is actually ridiculous. Have they been practiced? Oh my! Do you guys track? What is this? And keeping the cozy train going, you have Hot Cider, who has perhaps the coziest channel name, though we've got about 85 more to go, so we'll see. Now, if you're a super fan of video essays on YouTube, you've probably already stumbled across Hot Cider without realizing because they do the thumbnails for Jacob Geller, Rasputin, Bobby Broccoli, and like every major player in the game. However, their own channel, Immaculate Thumbnails Aside, is I would consider right up there with all the rest. You have some really authentic discussions of Resident Evil 4, old Rare games, Wario, 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 <laughs> where every video has the writing, editing, and obvious thumbnail chops of a channel 10 times their size. Jokes aside, Hot Cider's biggest video, and the one I'm recommending, is Rise of the Wario Likes. Partially because it's a great dive into what makes Wario such a memorable character in their own franchise, but also because it's somewhat related to my recent rant video about video game genres. So if you liked that, you might like this. Following his introduction in Super Mario Land 2, The Six Golden Coins, Wario became Nintendo's most experimental platform mascot. Deviating from the Super Mario template, Wario games could mess with standardised elements like an end flight pole, power-ups and even health. But one unifying feature across all these games was, as you'd expect, the man himself. A heavyweight bully with a loss for treasure, Wario uses his super strength and resilience to do much more than Super Mario could. And hey, remember how I said Cider had done the thumbnails for a bunch of great YouTubers? Well one of them is Dark Fry, a video essay channel focused heavily on game design. They tackle a lot of topics like accessibility in fighting games, effective difficulty, and video game music in a pretty laid back yet thoughtful way. With their V2. Why can't I say VTuber? What, what is happening? With their VTuber avatar and comedic bits adding a lot of levity to what could otherwise have turned into some pretty dry discussions. Though the discussions themselves are honestly incredibly informative and nuanced and definitely have helped me form my own opinions for videos before, so shout out. The video I'd recommend from them is Designing Dark Souls Easy Mode, which is an hour long exploration of difficulty in the Soul series and how it could be looked at differently. It's fantastic for anyone who cares about game design or difficulty in games. If you've seen my video on it, you should do yourself a favor and check out Dark Fry. A game with multiple difficulties must be fun in all of them. There are many games that only feel well designed if played on their intended difficulty, making the other difficulties feel like more of an afterthought included only out of necessity to comply with conventional difficulty options. Metroid Prime 3 on hard mode becomes a chore akin to doing your taxes, since its idea of difficulty is giving every boss an obscene health pool, leaving you in battles that aren't more challenging, but just longer, with fuckers like this one that just won't die! And if you have seen my video on video game difficulty, then you've definitely heard of these next two. 
Frogwater makes some great content playing through and discussing their favorite games. Fury, Inscription, Battlerite, Kenshi, Dark Souls 2, they're another channel with great laid back vibes who can engross you in a 40 minute video without having you even think of the word boredom. Though, as I talked about previously, they also have one of the best discussions of accessibility and difficulty that I've seen. However, I recommended that video last time and don't want to just imply they're a one trick pony, so the video I'll link to this time is Baba which is a five minute video explaining and recommending Baba Is You. It is super simple and super entertaining, plus it has a title that still makes me chuckle when I look at it. Eventually you forget that you're looking at fun little icons that represent something in games that you're used to and start thinking of everything interactable as objects, even Baba, because Baba doesn't have to be you. You can be rock, you can be wall, you can be flag. Speaking of flag, it isn't always win. Wall can be win. Baba can be win. This game rules. I can't, I can't think of another game that has you babbling like a baby to get your point across to your friend. A channel that also talks about accessibility, and I've also mentioned in that difficulty in gaming video I made then, is Laura K. Buzz, who is just gonna get lumped in with Frogwater again for some reason. Sorry, hope you two are cool with that. Laura is an accessibility advocate through and through, who makes a series called Access Ability, which reviews and talks about the different accessibility features in new games. And that is something I respect a lot because I don't think there's enough focus on it in the gaming industry at the moment. But I also genuinely enjoy the videos because they're informative and to the point without feeling dry or clinical. Plus, Laura also podcasts a lot, so if you want to hear them in a more loose format, there's a lot of content out there for you. The recommended video for Laura is a bit hard just because a lot of the specific accessibility reviews are for specific games that you might not have played. So instead, I'll reach back for an older video, How Microtransactions Prey on Disabled Gamers, which is about pretty much exactly what the title says. Gamers with borderline personality disorder often suffer from poor impulse control, which can impact their relationship with microtransactions. I spoke to multiple gamers with BPD who specifically noted that time-limited microtransactions, such as when a skin in Fortnite is only available for a limited time, were a big issue for them. As soon as something seems scarce, their brain wants to purchase it right away without thinking, in case they later want it and can't get it. And to wrap up this list of gamers, we have the truest gamer of all, a literal trash can. And not, I'm, I'm not calling them trash, I think everyone in this video is great. Uh, the next channel is just literally a trash can, it even says so in their bio. <laughs> Young Junko makes some honestly wacky review content, mostly focusing on some really obscure and bizarre games like the Obi-Wan Kenobi Xbox exclusive or Jackass on the PSP. And they also do a bunch of more general media discussions if you're into that. Really, their whole channel has this feeling of a normal gaming content creator on just a tiny bit of acid. Like, not a lot, but you're certainly microdosing. <laughs> However, they are incredibly entertaining with this bizarre production style that really fits the kind of content they make. It feels like Junko has already hit that groove that most YouTubers strive for, where every video just instantly feels like a classic. The video I'd easily recommend from them then is the PSP's cute little video format, which goes over the movies put on the PSP and how strange they all were. Before this, there was the infamous Game Boy Advance video, a format we've all harassed to death by now with a video quality even a potato would find offensive. F you. That was a huge shift pretty fast, and being someone who was super fortunate enough to get a PSP around its launch, watching movies on it was an exciting feature that people in my life who didn't play video games were very shocked and surprised about. No father, I'm afraid I cannot play your nudie tapes on my PSP, it don't fit right, but there was a market for it in Japan that got pretty popular. And with that long list of gaming creators out of the way, and like 80 more to go, I'm gonna throw another curveball for channel number 20. This time with a cooking channel, or more specifically, his historical Italian cooking. As the name suggests, they cook ancient Roman, Italian, and medieval dishes while explaining the history of the dish and its significance. All of their videos are very short, very simple, and very... Well, I'll let you listen and see. Welcome to our kitchen. Today, we prepare an ancient Roman recipe that usually we don't associate with the ancient Mediterranean cultures. Jesus Christ, I had no idea your voice could even get that low. It is surprising every time I watch one of their videos. But I won't lie, it is also very relaxing. You can pick up any of HIC's videos without being interested in the dish or the topic and just enjoy it for the ASMR qualities alone. But the dishes and the cooking are actually good if you care about them. They follow the ancient recipes to a T, including picking their own herbs and using a mortar and pestle, which is 
crazy to me. The video I'd recommend from them is Ancient Roman Pasta and Meatballs, because it's just a very fun idea, but pretty much any of their recipes are good to start with. First, we prepare the dough with white wheat flour, salt, and warm water. This recipe is part of the cookbook conventionally attributed to Apicius. The author doesn't write how to make pasta. We find a description of pasta called tracta in Latin in Cato Agricultural Treatise. All right, back into the thick of it, this time with 11 anime channels that all kind of relate to each other in some way. Mostly because I'm pretty sure they've all collaborated with each other at some point. And what better channel to talk about collaborations with than The Weeb Crew, a rare anime podcast that actually talks about anime, and one that doesn't just make hour plus long podcast episodes featuring different anime creators, but a ton of shorter discussion videos about specific shows and topics. To sell them in one sentence, The Weeb Crew is essentially if Red Letter Media talked about anime. And I don't just mean they're inspired by Red Letter Media, which they are, but the two hosts, Mumi and Sai, really know what they're talking about when it comes to this stuff. They will regularly get pretty deep into talking about various shows and genres or the different behind the scenes of anime production. Even their shorter videos will be surprisingly insightful for unscripted discussion. And I think more importantly, very funny. And I watched this movie on Netflix, or I don't, is there a physical release? Jiro Taniguchi's dead. You're not supporting him. <laughs> like. Oh, okay, never mind. Uh, go ahead. Death of the author. <laughs> <laughs> That's how that works, right? <laughs> now, as I'm recording this, I've actually done an episode of their podcast, so if that's out already, then I'm 100% going to recommend that because I'm a narcissist. But if for whatever reason it isn't out, uh, I don't know, some other video will be here, I guess. I think I'll probably just name this episode our most censored episode yet. The most compromised episode of the week. Oh, God. We try to ruin Lex Torius' career. We try to ruin Lex, Lex Torius up, gets canceled. Up, <laughs> let, me, let me pull up a diagram of the <laughs> so we can get to planning. I need a spray bottle. Just <laughs> <laughs> you a loud buzzer. Shit. A, loud, a loud sensor that just overlaps his audio. Oh, I'm, I'm going to have to cut all that. This is going to be really fun for the people on Patreon because they're going to be the only ones who are hearing any of this. Focusing more on the shorter anime discussions then, you have Roger Smith 2004 who is an OG YouTuber through and through, making tons of videos across eight years about different anime. They've talked about pretty much everything under the sun, adaptations, anime awards, cover art, and a ton of specific shows. Roger brings a very thoughtful look at the topics they cover and has so much experience with the medium that makes each video engaging and fun. They're well thought out and entertaining, even when going through Roger's old stuff. My recommended video is How Food in Anime Broke Me, which is a nice discussion about how the use of food can elevate a story or tie into it in interesting ways, which Roger relates to their own life and experience. It's great. Enjoying a good meal, or in the case of this story, a good cup of coffee, regardless of one's reasoning for doing it, on a subconscious level, it brings attention to this one truth. We must eat and we must drink to survive. If we starve, if we thirst, then we perish. So by eating or drinking in public, we're showing that vulnerability that need to survive. If longer anime content is more your style though, Caribou-kun might have what you're looking for. I mean, not all of their videos are long, and I certainly don't think they're trying to fit into that niche specifically, but with several hour-long videos going into Naruto, Ojimaja Dorame, and Osamu Dezaki, among others, they certainly have more than enough long-form content to binge through. The thing I really love about Shabe's videos is that they focus a lot more than usual on the background and production of the anime they're talking about. If you're watching a video on Naruto or Lupin the Third or what have you, you're not just getting an opinion and a plot synopsis or anything, you're going deep into everybody who worked on it and all of its different inspirations. Every one of Caribou-kun's videos really do earn their length, and for me, they're an absolute blast to watch. Plus, if you don't care about any of that, they also have a great selection of AMVs on their channel as well. Their recommended video, though, is honestly one of the best that I've seen on the platform, What Inspired Gurren Lagann. It's a two-hour dive into just about everything behind the creation of the show, and it honestly sets a standard for videos like this that I hope to one day live up to. 
Yoshinori Kanada is an animator and storyboarder who worked from the 1970s through the 2000s, and is arguably the single most influential animator in Japan. That's a very larger-than-life claim, but I find it appropriate when you're discussing such a larger-than-life figure. When there's a whole generation named after you like the Kanada School, with the respect of titans like Hayao Miyazaki and Hideaki Anno, and are anointed the father of Sakuga by fans all around the world, I don't think it's such a hyperbole to make. And if you heard me say AMVs and wanted a channel with a ton more of them, then Gil Lies Here has you covered. Now, I'm not an AMV person, and I can't really show clips of any without risking copyright, but Gil's are some of the best I've seen. I mean, Evangelion edited to a Death Grip song feels like it was specifically made for me, and the editing itself is so creative and nice to look at. Plus, Gil has made regular video essay content as well, so there's a little bit for everyone. Stuff talking about otaku, anime translations, and misconceptions of isekai. To me, these videos are right up there with a lot of the other channels that I mentioned at the beginning, with some of them even being direct collaborations with those channels. So the video from Gil I'll show off is everyone was wrong about this anime. The anime in question is Death March, and the whole video is this absolutely fascinating dissection of the genre of isekai as it relates to Japanese culture. It is a fantastic watch. Death is a necessary element of Tensei Isekai, but what death represents tells us a lot about the genre's attitude towards modernity. Karoshi, death by overwork, at least how we think about it, is a product of Japan's post-war economy. Emerging in the Showa era, salary man masculinity became the standard. To be a good Japanese man is to be a good worker. Going further into this Anitube rabbit hole then, you have Clear and Sweet, another anime-focused analysis channel with pretty impressive chops. I mean, anyone who's hosted a panel called Thinking About Anime 102, The Basics of Textual Criticism, is probably smarter than I'll ever be by default. <laughs> and with videos about visual storytelling in Utna or Madoka Magica, and podcasts talking about plenty of other shows, there's a whole grab bag here of anime content. A lot of it very focused on the magical girl genre, which might interest some of you. Clear's channel is just a treasure trove of videos in general though, partially since they've been making videos for almost a decade now. The video I'd suggest from them was originally going to be a Sailor Moon Iceberg video they made, but I think that's currently being taken down due to some BS copyright stuff. So instead, it's visual storytelling breaking down the adolescence of Utna part one, because it's a great analysis of a great animated movie, and it's a part one. So if you like it, you can just keep going. So as we open the film, I kind of want you to have that in mind. Who is this movie for? Is it for fans of Utna who already know the story and would understand the themes possibly? Or is it for fans of general anime and movies who maybe would lack a lot of context and be even more lost than most other people are? I can see wanting to split the difference, but I do think that the movie kind of ends up on the wrong side of both of those. Anyway. Focusing a bit more on Magical Girl, or shoujo-related anime then, we have Hayden the Historian, who makes analysis videos and documentaries about just that. Deep dives into niche Sailor Moon lore or the controversy surrounding that one Fruits Basket anime, plus a ton of members-only content talking about even more stuff. Hayden's videos are incredibly easy to watch, the way they present information is super Super comfortable and almost nostalgic in a weird way, and even when they're getting deep into more serious discussions, they keep up this cheery aesthetic that really helps make their videos fly by. My recommendation for what to watch from Hayden is easily The Fruits Basket Problem, a video that talks about the history of the series and some of the controversy surrounding the 2001 anime adaptation. It's a fascinating video, go check it out. This anime adaptation was put into production a couple years after the manga's initial publishing, and it had a lot to live up to. At this time, no one was more suited for the job than Akitaro Daichi. He is one of the most versatile directors in anime, with works ranging from the bleak now and then here and there to the cartoon Ikorucha, the latter of which is something that Natsuki Takaya had actually expressed interest in before. Daichi, however, 
did not think he was cut out for the job. Up next is Gomi-san, who focuses on analyzing different niches and topics related to anime and video games. They've talked about specific series like Rent-A-Girlfriend and Onimai, but also look at slice-of-life anime, Genshin Impact, and everyone's favorite Japanese language textbooks. Gomi-san mixes a good amount of comedy and serious analysis and discussion into their content. It feels like a balance between something that's actually trying to educate you or deepen your understanding of a subject and something that just exists to make jokes or share a personal story. My favorite video of theirs though is How Barnes & Noble Saved Manga, which goes through some of the history of anime outside of Japan, a link between manga sales and American bookstores, and the rise and fall of the pretty infamous Cool Japan program. Perhaps the biggest shock and earliest indication that anime might be breaking into the western mainstream was Spirited Away's unprecedented win for Best Animated Feature at the 2003 Academy Awards, an event so unexpected that Miyazaki wasn't even in attendance. While the traditional consumer electronic and heavy machinery companies floundered, Japanese cultural products found a way to firmly plant themselves in the imagination of an entire generation of kids across the globe. Following up, we have another hidden gem of AniTube, DavidMan001. DavidMan only has a couple videos on their channel and a few hundred subscribers, but in an ideal world, they'd have a thousand times more. Because each of their videos is easily at a level of quality rivaling channels way larger than them. One of the videos they have dives into Heybot, a wacky children's show anime that most haven't heard about, talking about the random comedy of the show and how it gives way to a genuinely moving story. And the other major video I watch from David Mann is also the one I'll recommend, What Makes Mr. Gimmick's Music So Great, which covers the soundtrack of the cult classic NES game Mr. Gimmick in a surprising amount of detail going through the specifics of the sound chip that it used, the way each song is composed, and the reason that all comes together to make something unique. Its soundtrack sounds like no other. Its complex polyphonic melodies and use of chords are something you rarely hear from music of the NES era. If you know anything about Gimmick, you've probably heard of the Sunsoft 5B. This revolutionary sound chip is well known for being packed in with the Famicom release of the game. The Sunsoft 5B added three extra sound channels to the already existing five, allowing the composer much more flexibility in composing for the NES. But this isn't the sole reason why the soundtrack excels as well as it Speaking does. of getting into technical aspects of old hardware in a surprising amount of detail, we then have The Smuggler. A fellow Canadian who has taken up the monumental task of re-encoding and subtitling retro anime and explaining a lot of the process and history of doing so. They have videos going in-depth into 90s fan subbing and Japan's adult animation industry, as well as a ton of their own remasters and bits of obscure media uploaded. And all of it is super fascinating to watch. The sheer technical knowledge and investment going into Smuggler's content is something I have to give a lot of respect to. Something of interest on their channel, to anyone who watches me, is their remaster of the Tenbatsu Angel Rabi OVA which was one of the first anime that I watched for my randomizer series. However, the video I'll be linking is how 90s weebs fan-subbed anime VHS, because it's a more straightforward look at what Smuggler does. So here I have the video previews from the back of the Sony mixer. On channel one, I can see the subtitles, and on the other, my laser disc of Burn Up Access. When I view the final output, we can see both coming together. This is with the Luma key applied to the subtitles, so the black part of the side subtitle video is transparent. Now, I need to ensure the timings both line up exactly. I set the VCR to record, and... And of course, I can't bring up fan subbing channels and older anime media without bringing up William Chow who, if you don't know, is pretty much the grandfather of fan subs in North America. He is the reason a lot of people got into anime in the 80s, because back then he was the guy who was actively creating and distributing English subtitled VHS tapes. And William has an entire series dedicated to documenting his experience with fan anime in North America, and basically the entire history of the space. 
a series that is well over 300 episodes deep, by the way, so there is a lot of it to binge through if it sounds interesting to you. Honestly, while you can really just go back to the beginning and watch the whole series front to back, my recommended video for William is my first anime store, where he talks about running a store called Anime Genai. It's a fascinating look at the past and a very good representation of what William's channel is all about. So let's do a quick walkthrough again. And I uh, just, just spin around just to see that the store is not very big, but uh, you know, it has a lot of stuff, uh, you know, pertaining to anime and different types of anime uh, that, that people can get into. Uh, you know, because again, yeah, things are kind of tough to get to. All right, so we'll stop by the video wall here and to see what I can spot here. I see Kishan, uh series there, uh, I see Megazone 23, uh, The Wings of Anime is. That's, uh... And to go full circle with this little group of Anitubers here, I'm actually double dipping on a creator on this list by featuring their second channel. That channel being... Hey, it's Shaves! 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 Hey, it's Shaves. Oh, it's Shaves. Shaves. Digest. 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 Caribou Coon's second channel, Shaves, is entirely dedicated to one single series. AnyTube Digest, where they watch all the new anime-related videos from different channels across YouTube and catalog the best and worst of them every week. If you are at all interested in anime-related videos, and for whatever reason the list of them I'm giving you here isn't enough, then absolutely check out Digest. I would call it a fundamental pillar of this part of AnyTube, and something that I've used to find a lot of the channels in this list, and just in general. And to recommend a specific video is kinda pointless, because it's a weekly series, so you know, just go to their channel and check out the newest upload. But pointing to one that I think is a bit unique, we have the Under 1K special they did a couple years back, where they shouted out smaller channels they thought were cool in a way that I totally ripped off for this video. Uh, sorry? You know how like most YouTube channels are pretty much, they pretty much ride or die by their performance and by their their sound and their delivery as a, as a creator. Maybe their writing style might incorporate into that a little bit. But it's hard to like, say that, oh, that was a this person's video based on their editing. Like a lot of people's vi uh, editing are stemmed from what they've seen. Climbing before. out of the anime rabbit hole for a bit and getting a breath of fresh air, we have Polyblank, who you might know if you're into art YouTube at all, because they're like one of the two art channels that I can even think of, and they've collabed with the other one. Now, I don't know shit about art, don't care either, but when I see a video titled Paintings by Serial Killers, well, now I'm intrigued. And that's sort of the magic of Polyblank. They find these insane topics like paintings by serial killers or the unseen artists of North Korea, and they explain the topics with all the seriousness and nuance that they deserve, while also constantly cracking jokes and making the video fun. They've talked about it in a Q&A, but their whole goal is to make learning about art entertaining, which they absolutely excel at. Honestly, I'd recommend them more if you don't care about any of the topics they're talking about, because you probably will by the end. Definitely go check out their video, Who is the Worst Artist of All Time, which I think is the most clear-cut example of them talking about art in a way that few ever do. To keep it short, modern works are seen as low effort and easy to produce. Now, if we were to gouge art based on effort, then the greatest painters ever would be the pointillists, and the greatest artists would most likely just be those performance artists who ruined their lives for art, like Do Ching She, who punched a clock and took a photo every hour for a whole year, meaning he never slept and he never left the studio for more than an hour. In an interview after the work was finished, Shea said the mental anguish was comparable to living in the Balkans for a day. Sort of tangentially related to art videos then, and also pretty much just here because I didn't know where else to put them, we have The Celador, a YouTuber making content about literature and more specifically the histories and stories of famous authors and their works. If you're interested in Anthony Bourdain, Ernest Hemingway, or the time Kurt Cobain met William S. Burroughs, well, that's the exact kind of thing that the Celador has talked about. Between that and their more straightforward literary analysis, there's a good amount of learning you can do from their videos. However, the cozy atmosphere they add makes them particularly relaxing to watch as well. Their recommended video is probably one that many of you have seen on your homepage before, since it has almost 5 million views, which is insane, Rage by Stephen King, the book you're not supposed to read. It's an accounting of King's quite controversial novel, Rage, originally penned on under a pseudonym and the events that got it pulled from shelves entirely. And I'd say the video easily deserves all those millions of views. During the 1970s, Stephen King was ascending to the celebrity status of being a household name. With the release of Carrie, Salem's Lot, and The Shining, 
King had been writing bestsellers faster than his publishers could release them. And that is not hyperbole, it was genuinely the case for King. As any fan will know, King's work rate is incredibly high, and his consistency is rarely faltered throughout his career. He typically writes at least six pages a day. Yet for King, in the mid-1970s, his ability to churn out novels was both a blessing and a curse. Getting things back into balance, I now have seven gamers to recommend to you. That's right, the best of the best. They are all being recommended purely on their gaming skill and not the fact that I find their videos to be funny and entertaining. And the first gamer I'll suggest is Cassidy Hunt, who is Australian, and that's pretty much everything you need to know. Being real for a sec, Cassidy makes these insanely quick cut comedy videos focused on different games, primarily Pokemon, but they cover a wide variety of topics on their channel alongside that, and always seem to find about a thousand different jokes to make about each one. Combined with editing that I'm sure would kill a Victorian child, I'm sure quite a lot of you will find something to like about them. Especially if you like yoga balls. My favorite video of Cassidy's though is ranking every video game the Australian government has banned. Because the topic is pretty self-explanatory and gives way to a ton of really great jokes about different M-rated games. Australia is infamous for its ridiculous video game laws that have banned some of the best and most popular games ever made. So today, I want to rank every video game the Australian government has banned as an Australian. Now you might be asking, well Cassidy, as an Australian, how are you gonna play these games if they're banned in Australia? Ah, oi, got a big leg mate. All right, let's slow down a bit. Instead of channels with a bunch of different topics, what about one that hyper focuses on just a few things? Like every single Shy Guy, every single Kong, everything about Klungo. <laughs> That's right, I'm talking about Carlito, who makes some of the most specific videos I have ever seen. I guess you'd call them a gaming historian. These videos do technically go through and document the subject they're talking about, and they have more normal uploads like the rarest Nintendo consoles, but honestly, when I saw a 30 minute video that just listed every single shy guy that's ever been in a Mario game, one after the other, I knew Carlito was something special, because they somehow turned that bit into something entertaining for the entire runtime. And none of this is even mentioning my recommended video for them, every single Goomba. Which gets props almost solely because Goomba is an inherently funny word, and Carlito manages to make it even funnier every time they say it. For 30 minutes straight. There's a couple more space Goombas too, like the Goom Beetle, a cool ass Goomba that wears a helmet and has red eyes. That's all that one does. Then the Jacko Goomba, which at first looks really lame, just a pumpkin-headed Goomba. But this Goomba is probably the most successful Goomba in the Mario universe, because I'm not aware of any other Goomba that owns their own planet. The Jacko Goomba planet? Are you kidding me, bro? Revk is an interesting channel, mostly because I don't know how to pronounce their name, and I'm not going to try. But also interesting because most of their videos are these 20 minute comedy videos about side quests or Shrek games, which basically just use the subject of the video as a launch board for all 150,000 ironic memes that they edit in. And then you get to Darkwood, my recommendation for them which is an hour-long video essay retrospective about an indie horror game that goes through the entire thing with a surprising amount of seriousness and depth. It gives the horror in the game time to breathe while also just splicing in Breaking Bad clips like they're meeting a quota. Honestly, the whole video is very impressive, and I found it when RevK was at less than a thousand subscribers. So I'm highly recommending it. It's honestly one of my favorite videos that I've seen this year. But it's a horror game, so there are sounds that you don't really want to hear. Someone or something trying to break in. Okay, that was that was heavy. It's been like 20 seconds without a meme. So to keep people entertained, here's a picture of my dad. <laughs> so now you all got your dopamine hit. Let's talk about me. Going from one channel with a strange username to another one, we have Melody No Surname. Melody is another channel that makes videos about pretty much anything and everything. Social media, gendered video games, top 10 dead Sega IPs that need to come back. In fact, with all these different topics, I'm not sure if they quite fit into the hardcore gamer category that I grouped them in. But then again, they have a video called Tiny Baby Mario, so never mind. 
While the topics are various, the presentation of Melody's videos is what ties everything together. You can just tell they put a lot of love and care into the visuals and sound effects and music. There's whole animated segments and hand puppet bits and a ton of different editing jokes all throughout. All of it comes together to make videos that feel effortless despite how much goes into them, which would be an achievement for a channel even 10 times their size. And Melody's greatest video is, appropriately, the greatest show you've never seen. A deep dive into a Chilean kids show that honestly looks like a Jim Henson fever dream, which Melody takes great joy in showing off. Magito isn't a main character like all the others I've named and will continue to name, but he's one of my favorites. Dante Torbellini is a magician who quite simply just wants to do his show by any means necessary. Tulio, Tulio. Si? Te quería pedir un favor muy, pero muy personal. ¿Cuál? Que dejes actuar al mago de nuevo. Pero, pero, ¿por qué? Si es un desastre. Porque me está apuntando con una pistola. <gasps> Quiero hacer mi show. However, someone who doesn't take joy in anything, I'm pretty sure, is the Infinite Review. Formerly known as Mecha Gamezilla, they made videos reviewing games for over a decade before just deciding that they'd review everything in the universe instead. And I mean everything. Virtual Boy, Neon Genesis Evangelion, every Dreamcast light gun game, the fucking Tetris McNugget. If it exists, the Infinite Review will eventually get around to making sarcastic jokes about it in video format. Jokes so dry that I'm not sure if they're meant to be funny or a cry for help. Would people really still go to a wrestling match while their world collapsed around them? But then again, the Infinite Review is Irish, and I think they're all just like that. But honestly, the video that I'd recommend from them is the complete storyline of Tekken so far, because there's no better way to get accustomed to the sense of humor on display than with them seriously explaining the entire lore of the Tekken franchise. Ah, uh, only mess, and that wasn't even Ogre's final form. Don't you know he absorbed Hayachi's fighting force? I guess it's up to the boy in the box to defeat the true Ogre. Nice work, Jin. Unfortunately, he is then gunned down and shot in the brains by the very man who created world peace, proving that you really can't trust anyone. Hey, do you like Let's Plays? No? Me neither, but I love Creeltube, probably because their idea of a Let's Play is less so unedited gameplay footage and more so highly produced and animated bits with gameplay scattered throughout. People have pointed this out in their comment section to the point that I'm sure they're sick of it, but Creel's videos honestly look like something you'd see on Adult Swim at 3 in the morning where pretty much every one of them will start off normally and then immediately go in a direction that you would never expect. However, unfortunately, Creel stopped making new stuff about two years ago. Up until a couple months ago when they made a fully animated short announcing that they're coming back, which is the video that I'm gonna recommend for them. Before we start, want me to show you Persona 5? It's pretty cool, like you can get demons and pussy and stuff. Nah. I heard anime games like that are really creepy about high school girls. Yeah, well like fucking 11 years old. Look, dude, I'm not trying to damage my fragile little psyche. Now let's go look at those titties in Cyberpunk. And the final gamer in this little section, which is barely about gamers, is Cellshock, who is actually an animator, this time in 3D. Or whatever this style is called. Corey, that's you. You're that friend in the group, and I'm not letting you get away with this narrative that you're not that guy. Cellshock currently has two videos on their channel, but both are absolute bangers. The first one is the problem with shooters and how Doom fixed it, which has a more straightforward comedic video essay structure, even though it still has that crazy animation style that Cell does. The second video, and the one I'll recommend, is what is the first ghost story in human history? Which, I mean, just guess what that one's about. Or don't, I'll be showing a clip in a second, because it's a much more loose and I don't know, story timey type of video that I thought was really cool and unique. Ghost beam. Huh? Dude, that wasn't even a beam. This is more like a pool. Ah! Ghost are a concept that I've been aware of for as far back as I can remember. I honestly can't say that I remember learning what a ghost is. I've always just been like, yep, ghost. I thought it was kind of weird that I don't remember when I learned what ghosts were. 
but I think that just goes to show just how heavily the concept is ingrained in humans across all cultures. So the next little group of channels up on the chopping block is honestly connected entirely through vibes. Like, I don't have any other explanation for why they're all in this section. Vibes are just really important to me when it comes to videos, and these nine channels excel at creating good ones. Amelie Dory, for example, is a channel focused on talking about and diving into visual novels. All of their videos are these 40 minute plus explorations of different games in their history, impact, and overall story, and they are all fascinating. I have never really cared about visual novels or known anything about them, so I have no context for what the subject of most of these videos are, but the fact that I can still wholeheartedly recommend them should tell you a lot about Amelie's ability to construct a video. The way they can weave this narrative around each topic and very casually sort of lead you through all of their points is incredibly satisfying to watch. And if I had even less of a life than I currently do, I would absolutely just throw on all their videos in a playlist and non-stop binge every single one. If I had to choose a recommendation though, I would absolutely go with 3DO in Japan, the Ichio of the 90s, which talks all about the 3DO game console and its unique developer platform. It's a very accessible video and just as comfy and entertaining as everything Amelie makes. Since 3DO was an architecture that companies could license and not one specific console, everyone had their own spin on it. You got LG's first take on the Gold Star 3DO of its weirdly chunky look, the Sanyo Tri that looks like an early 2000s DVD player, the cost-reduced Panasonic FC10 that looks like an average CD game system, and the OG that I have here, the Panasonic FZ1, which goes for a 90s premium hi-fi aesthetic a la Laserdisc or SVHS player, be fitting of the 700 goddamn USD price tag it had during the first few months of its life. Base Skater is a bit of a strange channel, they also focused quite a bit on visual novels, though a lot of their newer videos have drifted sort of towards early 2000s media and internet culture, or WTF moments in gaming. A lot of the time they'll go through a list of different related obscure pieces of media discussing their history and significance. You've got stuff like disturbing Vocaloid songs, gaming debug modes, and YouTube April Fool's jokes. And the discussions of the topics are entertaining on their own, but Bass Skater's editing is what pushes it over the top, because they have somehow mastered this bizarre combination of really high effort transitions and effects alongside lo-fi, purposefully dated visuals, where every video feels like it was somehow edited in the period of time it's talking about. It's very fun to watch. The video from them I think best shows off their work is Exploring Dead YouTube videos, where Bass Skater finds a bunch of obscure older videos that have various glitches and broken elements to them and shows them all off. Now we're going to get in some of the glitched out videos on YouTube that have weirder properties. This first one I found organically semi-recently by Alan Thrall talking about bad deadlift form. Based on the comments from seven years ago, it seems the video used to be fine, but nowadays if you try to watch this video, it works fine for the first few minutes, but then at the 4 minute and 31 second mark after making a remark about it being all on the hips, a Happy Gilmore clip plays saying the same thing, but the video doesn't show in the actual video and only plays the audio. However, if you scan over the playhead on that section, you can see that the clip appears and then the audio begins to extremely desync and his movements don't match at all with what is happening in the video. If you want some more classic anime discussions though, Pyramid Inu does that. Kinda. Sometimes. I mean, they've talked about anime, but their overall focus seems to be more on Japanese media in general, with videos about different live action movies and directors and such. Most Pyramid Inu videos will essentially take you through a piece of media or its surrounding influence, telling everything you need to know, its backstory, and Inu's relationship with it, all in this very casual, your friend telling you about a fixation of theirs type of way. Which isn't to say these videos don't have a ton of effort put into them, but rather that they come off as effortless, which I always respect a lot. And nothing shows this off more than their titles, which might be some of my favorite on YouTube. Though my recommended video from Inu is actually Let 1000 Rei Ayanami's Bloom, because it's about the moe phenomena in Japan, otaku databasing, and why so many people just straight up made ripoffs of Rei Ayanami. If you've seen my video on anime waifus, I'd consider this a pretty perfect follow-up to that, since it dives into a topic that's very closely interlinked. For whatever reason, I find the stoic, silver-haired anime girl archetype really neat. It might be because Ava is still my favorite series, or it might be something about the calm and control that this sort of stoicism can exude. But regardless, if there's one of these sorts of characters in a show, I'll probably give it a shot. 
And because Ava is kind of the anime written about in academia, there's a lot of writings in this archetype. If you want a channel that actually features more classic anime discussions, then I'd recommend Grimm. Grimm, who almost didn't make it into this video because it's impossible to find their channel through the YouTube search bar, talks all about anime and manga in some pretty straightforward discussion slash video essay content. They've shown off the appeal of Satoru Goju. How do I? Did I mispronounce both of it? They've shown off the appeal of Satoru Gojo, talked about some manga with incredible potential, and they've even brought up the underappreciated Madhouse Gungrave anime. Really, a lot of what they make is something you'd see from those typical larger anime channels, but that's exactly why I like them. Grimm makes videos that feel like they're coming from a channel with a verified checkmark. They have the visuals, the script writing ability, and most importantly, the obvious passion that shines through and makes their videos stand out. The video from Grimm I check out first though is Why Berserk 1997 is Special, which goes through the 97 anime adaptation and why it's so beloved. Studio OLM, despite being a relatively new studio, was given the task of adapting Berserk, which at the time wasn't the well-known beloved manga that it is currently, but started to gain popularity during the release of the Golden Age. After the arc wrapped up in December of 1996, the production for the anime began in early 97. However, the first episode was set to come out in October, which only gave the team about 10 months to produce a good chunk of the episodes. And despite the approaching deadline, they created something incredible. Grey Link is a YouTuber. Guys, I am 10,000 words into the script at this point and we're not even halfway through. I don't know why I thought I could make this video in less than a month. <laughs> Grey Link is a YouTuber that puts out some genuinely moving video essays on anime and video games. Videos that cover introspective and surprisingly nuanced topics like performativity in Satoshi Kon films and how different anime tackle loneliness, and videos that have emotionally resonated with me both because they're genuinely well made and also because they're so criminally underrated. Like one or all of these need to blow up and get a million views, otherwise I'm gonna be pissed. The quality on display here is top notch and the particular aesthetic that Greylink chooses to go for is right up my alley. The first video I'd suggest you check out though is a video game made for nobody. In it, Grey discusses this obscure indie horror game that seems like a strange combination of Dark Souls, Silent Hill, and the manga Blam, and I just think the discussion itself is fantastic while also being fantastically well edited. The game indulges in surrealism in order to make you feel unwelcome, stupid, and powerless by putting you in the dark abyss and making you hurt these beings and leading you through these incomprehensible spaces all the while using light as a carrot on a stick to lure the donkey. But with all its surrealism and dream-like nature, Abyssal Somewhere does have a story to tell. So after Grey Link's channel, I of course want to highlight Grey Mads. Entirely because both their names have Grey in them. That's like the only reason I put them back to back like this. Grey Mads talks a lot about music. They've made videos about Limp Bizkit, Mindless Self-Indulgence, and that one band named after the creators of Killer Clowns from Outer Space, but they've also covered RPG Maker horror games, Yume Nikki, and a bunch of other related stuff. Really, the best way I'd describe their type of content is strangely relaxing discussions about not so relaxing topics. And I do mean that seriously, from the music choice to the Silent Hill sound effects to the late night radio style narration, it's all super engaging and has such a nice vibe to it. I mean, just from seeing the little Windows title bar at the top of all their thumbnails, you should be able to see what you're getting into here. Though personal recommendation from Grey Mads is Liminality and Silent Hill which discusses the entirety of the horror series to explore its relationship to the idea of the liminal and liminal spaces. It is great. Not many games in any medium radiate the same power, admiration, or legacy that Silent Hill does. There are only a handful of other series that have had a similar level of impact on me, and judging by the staying power of the series, I'm not really alone here. Loot is another excellent channel if you're looking for a specific sort of relaxing long-form video. They've talked mostly about video games with discussions about Wario Land 4 and Mega Man X4 and Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, going into their history with each game and why they love it, and usually sort of casually making jokes and meandering into tangential stories or bits of information. I guess to put it simply, loot videos are essentially structured in the same way that I tell stories. 
where one thing will just lead into another until you forgot what you were originally talking about. And that's not to slight them in any way, I personally love it, it's very refreshing to hear this casual type of discussion about games, especially because they are very interesting and funny. My favorite video from them is also my favorite title for a video on YouTube, considering I stole it from my Twitter bio, having fun on the computer for free which goes through a bunch of free indie games and what makes each of them special. Purgatory is a point-and-click adventure game slash visual novel. I was definitely drawn to it because of the art style. I enjoy the just sketch the cinema's paint look of it all. The character designs are cute, and I enjoy the theme of the environment around them being stark white while they're all one solid color. It's all very charming and attractive, and it makes a good first impression. So the premise is like, you start out in an office with this turtle lady. A fish's paradise makes gaming videos? I think. Their videos feel like they would shove my videos into a locker. Mostly making content centered around retro video games, video game music, and top 10 anime chads. I'm gonna be honest, I don't think you're meant to take their channel 100% seriously. Their straightforward gaming videos are very good though. They're like the Wario version of your classic YouTube game retrospective, talking about old Nintendo promos and the Final Fantasy series and such, with a ton of effort put into the editing on top of a unique visual style and ironic sense of humor. It might not be for absolutely everyone, but I can guarantee that the people Fish's videos do click with will probably have a new favorite YouTuber. They just have that vibe to me. Now my recommended video for them is obviously the Raiden vs. Tomator death battle. This one's for you, McLean. Okay, but actually it's Cozy Games, which goes over a bunch of Fish's favorite comfort games and why they love them. Despite all the jokes I'm making about Fish's ironic sense of humor, it is a very sweet video and I highly recommend you watch it. Whether it be through a chill atmosphere, insane immersion, cool music, or just some good old fashioned relaxing gameplay, we're gonna talk about a few games that make me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. So, grab yourself a hot drink, a crusty Minecraft blanket, and let me tell you about why Kirby 64 is the greatest game ever created. That shit is not even true. If you're looking for some honest to God, genuine gaming and anime content though, I would highly recommend Key Smash. Their channel is the home of a series called We Have a Talk About, where they go through and discuss various video games, anime, manga, movies, books, concepts, really just about everything. Though a good amount of their videos showcase some pretty underrated pieces of media that Key Smash wants to share with people, and I think they do a superb job at doing that, using some pretty effective editing tricks alongside their narration to get you nice and immersed. My recommendation for them is What About Vib Ribbon, which takes a look at a strange PS1 rhythm game and its legacy. Vib Ribbon fucks so hard it makes me cum. I don't know how true this is because fuck man, how can I be expected to know every single video game in existence, but Parappa the Rapper is often considered the first rhythm game. Whether or not that's true, it's definitely the most influential game to the rhythm genre. But that's what happens when you get Masaya Matsuda and Nana Onsha to make a game. Shit's gonna be about music. <sighs> Channel number 50. We are only halfway through. And what better way to celebrate than with a channel that has made, and I don't say this lightly, some of the best videos I have ever seen. Fort Collins Productions. Monsters, Movies, and Mahler. Minecraft's Lost Souls. A Glimpse at Spectacle. These are video essays by FCP. And I mean true video essays. I know I throw that word around a lot to describe all sorts of things, but these videos are profound and have resonated with me deeply. The writing alone is worthy of an award of some sort, but the editing and sound design and everything else is just, like I said, some of the best I've seen. But the video from Fort Collins Productions that is by far the most impactful to me is The Great Mystery of Hawaii Part 2, a video about a concept album about it. Where did the name Tally Hall come from? Zubin? Um, uh, there's a mini mall around our house. It used to be a mini mall called Tally Hall. It was a food court and uh... The year is 2002, and in December of that year, the group Tally Hall would form. Spearheaded by the talents of lead vocalist and guitarist Joe Hawley, the group would label themselves as a rock band and gain a substantial following over the years. And since we're diving into some channels that do quite a bit of horror content, why not show off some that focus on horror? 
like 4 Plus, who has made horror shorts of their own and videos about different kinds of horror and horror media with thumbnails that I quite frankly don't want to show you because they're going to creep me out while I'm editing this video. <laughs> Analog horror has me traumatized. Analog horror haunts my dreams. Analog horror has followed me home. The scariest found footage horse. All right, that's enough of that. I'm a little pussy boy when it comes to scary stuff, even though I have a sick fascination with videos talking about it. And 4 Plus is so good at talking about it that I don't want to watch some of their videos. But if you're some sort of sick freak, then you'll probably love them. A good video to start with is the horror I can't handle. I don't have much written about it because it was midnight when I wrote this section and I didn't want to do a rewatch. Enjoy! If you've been here for a bit, you'd know that when it comes to these horror genres, I truly adore them all and appreciate each one for how it's able to convey different emotions out of different fears. Psychological horror with the loss of sanity, body horror with the loss of control, even cosmic horror with the loss of concept. Obviously, I am very much generalizing here, but there's a horror I have yet to cover that actually rocks me to my core more than any of the previous genres mentioned prior. If you want a horror channel that's a little more cozy though, I would highly recommend Floppycock. FP makes these incredibly long form videos explaining the plot and hidden stories behind popular horror media. And I do mean long form, like almost eight hours long sometimes. I don't, I don't even know how you do that. Sort of ironically though, while Floppycock discusses some pretty disturbing and creepy games and movies, they structure these videos as very casual and lighthearted breakdowns, where they will spare no detail in going through whatever it is they're talking about, but they'll often avoid showing jump scares or graphic images, often not even swearing in their videos which is ironic given the whole floppy cock thing. They honestly feel more similar to me in tone to like an old school game reviewer with skits and jokes sprinkled throughout their videos, which again, as someone who is easily scared is fine by me. Their recommended video from me is actually Faith Story Explained Chapter One, because as much as I love their Who's Lila video, it is longer than an entire Netflix miniseries, whereas the breakdown of the game Faith is a 40 minute part one, which is a bit easier to digest. We make our way back to the northbound path until we are suddenly accosted by a four-legged white humanoid crawling towards us. He screams at us, run, run, run. But when we hit him with the cross, he says, Cochino. We will keep this creepy demon in mind. All right, back to anime channels. I actually have 11 more for you. Most of whom are a bit more comedy focused, though honestly, these groupings are sort of falling apart on me here. <laughs> They all talk about anime. That's that's all I got. Starting off with Kexi, who is a bit of an oddity, a lot of their most famous videos actually dive into uncovering some obscure piece of anime lore that's usually only important to them. But alongside that is just them sharing their thoughts on anime as a whole, or talking about shows they liked or didn't, usually mixed in with videos that are almost entirely just shit posts. But none of that is really important because no matter what Kexi video it is, the main appeal is very much the humor. A very strange sense of humor that's equal parts puns and punchlines, and a sense of humor that I happen to love. Really, I just ask that if you're getting into Kexi, whatever you do, don't ask about the squid thing. The Kexi video I think you should start with is the 15 year hunt for this anime's strangest mystery. It's their most popular video, and for good reason, because it's a genuinely intriguing story about trying to find the identity of an obscure anime legend. For the last two years since finishing Dokuro-chan, I flipped the internet upside down looking for the identity of this unassuming head stretching back to nearly seven months before I even began making YouTube videos. It's a mystery that's loomed in the heads of, um, it, it, at least two other people for the last 15 years ever since the second season aired in 2007, and with a topic this rudimentary, it was no surprise to me that cracking this puzzle wouldn't be as easy as a simple reverse image search. I'd have to dig deeper. A lot deeper. So that leaves the question. Who is this man? Crunchy Bagels is another anime discussion channel, this time focusing a bit more on video essay or review type content, and a bit less on squids. But all the same, their videos are funny, engaging when they want to be serious, and share quite a different opinion compared to most big anime channels. In fact, Crunchy Bagels' pretty contrarian stance on a lot of things is one of the reasons I enjoy them so much. 
they tend to highlight sides of an argument you don't hear that much. Something that is definitely rare in online discussions of anything, let alone anime. So my recommended video from them is Onimai More Than Fan Service, for that exact reason. Because along with the obvious fan service connection, I just think this is a very good defense of a type of show that most people would typically dismiss. Definitely check it out. Although it's also worth mentioning that this show is loaded with episode directors, each of whom are also helping the show pop in their own way. Episode 2 in particular, episode directed and storyboarded by Eri Ire, has shots that just take my breath away with how utterly creative they are every single time I see them. This shot where Mahiro is looking at the public bath with this fisheye lens effect that moves as Mahiro turns her head, like, I cannot emphasize enough how utterly creative this is. If you want more unique subjects and an even more unique presentation, then KYDB actually makes some incredibly high effort long form reviews and discussions. Talking about stuff like Samurai Gun, Gone, and a bunch of other stuff I've never heard of, they're genuinely one of the most creative YouTubers I've seen when it comes to the green screen style video that they make. And their sense of humor is very strange to me, but absolutely top notch. <laughs> KYDB's whole channel is something I just have to give props to, just for the sheer amount of effort put into it. You can see it especially in their later videos where full 3D animations are just thrown in as a gag sometimes. Plus, they've built up a vibe that is completely different to your typical big anime channel, so there's someone to check out especially if you're looking for something different. And while they haven't uploaded in a fair bit, I do look forward to whatever they make next. My favorite video from them currently is Cockroach Girls, which is an overview of the trope of cockroach girls in anime. It's very funny, very interesting, and I'd highly recommend it. Everyone acts as if cockroaches are synonymous to contamination, as if touching one is the worst thing that could happen, sometimes even implying that looking at one is the worst thing that could happen. How about, instead of judging us, you could try looking past our horribly fucking disgusting aesthetic and see that some of us are actually fine lads. InaQ is an anime commentary channel that has focused a lot on the female side of being an anime fan, talking about girls in shonen or the male gaze, but to just label them as that would obviously be a massive injustice. Ina's commentary videos are sort of the final form of that older style of talk to camera anime video that I used to watch a while back, with some genuinely great editing, funny video ideas, and all the confidence of a YouTuber that is much more established and much taller than she actually is. My recommended video from Ina is, of course, her Can Women Like Fan Service video, which is a broader discussion of growing up with anime, but it also includes fan service in the title, so I'm legally obligated to shout it out. It's a very fun video. Go watch it. Did you know that Sailor Moon could beat Goku? Sailor Moon can beat Goku, did you know that? Look it up, look it up. Also, I can, canonically. It's in my YouTube bio, so it has to be true. But anyway, of course I couldn't talk about why girls like anime without acknowledging shoujo. And especially right now, I want to highlight major genres of shoujo, like magical girl anime or female-led isekai. Brandon talks, on the other hand, just is a big YouTuber, honestly. I, I don't know why he's on this list. He's got like 80,000 subscribers, more views than I do. If you're watching this and you're not subscribed to him, don't. He doesn't need it. He's probably going to be on Trash Taste one day. Actually, do me a favor and go to his channel and comment Lextorius is better. Go subscribe to Lextorius. Uh, and then watch his videos and stuff, because they're really good. In all seriousness, Brandon makes some of the funniest and most energetic anime content on the platform. Looking at his channel, you'd have no idea he didn't have a million subscribers, because everything he makes would fit right in with some of the greats. If I had to pick just one for you to watch though, I'd pick This Anime Is Batshit Insane, which is a very normal video about a very normal anime called Nichijou. So, imagine you were given a hundred bazillion dollars, unlimited time, and one of the greatest animation studios in Japan, and were told to get all that and create an anime adaptation of a dank meme. The result would be crap, since you're generally not supposed to put a high-end production in the hands of a random person, unlike Netflix. Let's say you put that task in the hands of some extremely talented individuals I couldn't be bothered to research, and what do you get instead? Comedy flipping gold. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you for a moment. This video has been very difficult to write. There's only so many ways that I could say, they talk about new anime, but in a totally cool way that's way different to all the other channels that do it. Uh, so anyway, Daniel talks about new anime, but in a totally cool way.
Jokes aside, I really enjoy Daniel's perspective on shows. They bring a pretty level-headed discussion to newly airing releases and other hidden gems that complements their more down-to-earth style. Which is great if you're maybe a little sick of high energy all the time. My favorite video of theirs isn't about a specific anime, however, but a specific studio. From shame to fame, Studio Cloverworks Redemption is all about the studio's ups and downs throughout their history, all leading up to some of their newest popular releases. It's a great look at the behind the scenes of the industry, which I always appreciate. Officially formed in October of 2018, the studio was actually a part of A1 Pictures, who you probably know for anime such as Sword Art Online, Love is War, and 86. It was initially just a studio rebrand, but at some point Cloverworks eventually made the decision to declare its independence. Unfortunately for Cloverworks, freedom is never that simple, and they are still a subsidiary of the production company Aniplex, which is notorious for its poor scheduling and overworking studios under its belt, which we'll get to later. Switching to something more introspective and much more video essay -y, we have Kevin Nya, who talks about anime with a much more critical eye, going through character studies and thematic analysis of stuff like Violet Evergarden, Mashoku Tensei, and Oshinoko. Kevin has broken down popular series in ways that can easily make you rethink your perspective on them, and they do a great job at making each video entertaining on top of that. With videos on a ton of different shows and movies, I'd say there's something here for any fan of the medium looking for something deeper. The video I'd recommend from them is actually The Point of ReZero, which breaks down the characters and their struggles, talking about one of the core themes of the show in a simple but powerful way. Watching ReZero Season 2 has made me realize something very important that your experiences with media and storytelling can change over time, that no matter how set in stone you thought your opinions were before, it's possible to see something in a different light that elevates it more than some of its parts. If you told me a few years ago that ReZero would be one of my favorite anime in modern times, I would have laughed. But yet, here I am making this video because I- Meanwhile, Kyle Robes, another video essayist mainly talking about anime, stands out to me for not only their succinct discussions of different shows, but the insane amount of effort put into their editing. Where they not only cut in some very fun visuals, but make their own music for every video. Now, I know there are other YouTubers that do this, but Kyle's use of their own soundtrack is just one part of why their stuff blows me away. Everything is just so well put together that it's hard to believe Kyle isn't one of the most beloved anime channels on YouTube. Now, they've talked about Attack on Titan, Cyberpunk, and Mob Psycho, and more serious breakdowns of plot, themes, and characters, but the video I want to highlight is actually what keeps you happy, which is about Spy Family. I think the more lighthearted tone of the show, contrasted with the deep analysis, makes for something that's easy to watch and interesting to learn about. Go watch it, it's good. Spy X Family, or just Spy Family, the manga, was originally released in Shonen Jump Plus in 2019, with an adaptation, Spy Family, the show, from Studio Wit and Cloverworks, airing in 2022. The story is the brainchild of Tatsuya Endo, creator of series like Tista and Gekka Bijin. From what Wikipedia tells me, Spy Family takes elements from some of Endo's one-shots, I Spy, Ishini Usubeni Tetsuni Hoshi, and Rengoku no Ash. This show makes me happy. Now, these channels I've been throwing at you have been pretty big though, with several thousand subscribers each, but one anime analysis channel at less than a thousand subs that I really like is Hikaru. Not only because their discussions themselves are great, but because they've talked about some interesting anime, like Princess Tutu, Wolf's Reign, and Dot Hack, bringing an engaging perspective to some pieces of media that most don't really discuss. My favorite Hikaru video, though, is Code Geass The Power of Symbols, because despite how talked about Code Geass is, I feel like this is one of the better dissections of its main themes that I've seen. This is the point where Code Geass introduces us to one of the core elements that drive its narrative. The importance of symbols and their power over human consciousness. A topic that is explored in multiple ways throughout the series. The Britannian Empire itself uses symbols to display dominance over its colonies. Territories that fall under the Empire's control aren't allowed to retain their name and are named after numbers instead. And I couldn't talk about anime channels without bringing up Be More Brass, who has some great and underrated videos about stuff like Demon Slayer, Spy Family, and Jujutsu Kaisen. Their videos are refreshingly short and succinct, usually giving their thoughts on whatever they're talking about in less than 10 minutes. 
you're in, you're out, and you're entertained in the same amount of time some other YouTubers take to just start their videos. Though, if you want something longer, then my recommendation for them, The Art of Death in Chainsaw Man, is a 30 minute dive into, well, Chainsaw Man's use of death. It is one of my favorite discussions anyone has had regarding Chainsaw Man, a series that I hold very dearly, and it's a serious contender for one of my favorite videos, period. It's just that good. Death has no truth for the living. There is no empirical way to observe what comes after. The world of fiction is the only place humanity has to truly explore it in endless iteration. It is an incredibly important bastion for not only our own ephemeral existence, but also our own peace of mind. An attempt to reach even a modicum of understanding before our time is up. Speaking of channels that focus on quick videos about otaku media, QuickTaku. Just take a wild guess what they make. <laughs> a rom-com anime for gamers? Four minutes. The voice behind Oshinoko's opening? Five minutes. Bochi is society? Just over five minutes. QuickTaku absolutely lives up to the name and delivers insightful yet compact videos about various anime-related topics. Do not look at their several really long tier list videos they uploaded recently. Those don't completely dismantle my point at all. Focus all on the short and sweet anime content you can get from this channel, because I think it's pretty cool. And a particularly cool video from QuickTaku is the year that changed anime. I won't spoil what year it is, but the video is all about some great older shows that came out in the span of 365 days that some consider to be the greatest of all time. Starting with winter, there was a completely normal Maho Shoujo anime that had absolutely no horrifying content whatsoever. Madoka Magica. It was tea parties and positive vibes all around, but of course, no anime could get the number one spot in a season if that's all it was packing. So actually, Madoka Magica was pain and suffering the anime. Yum. If, for whatever reason, general anime discussions aren't for you though, and you'd prefer some more specific topics, then the Cartoon Cipher actually talks a lot about anime dubs in a pretty interesting and fun way. Breaking down some of the best dubs, some of the worst dubs, some of the hentai dubs, Cartoon Cypher has talked all about the history and behind the scenes of pretty much everything related to the art form of English translated anime. If you want to learn all about this strangely specific aspect of the medium, they have absolutely got you covered. It is fascinating to learn about. A particularly fun video from Cypher though, and one that's incredibly relevant with everything going on with the film industry right now, is Union Anime Dubs, which obviously ties into the history and connection between dubbed anime and unionized voice actors. For something that's all about creating stories that people can empathize with, the acting business is very unempathetic. It's saturated with content that constantly competes for our limited attention, and even that saturation is saturated with people competing to be a part of it. Voice actors are generally freelance, needing to repeatedly audition for new jobs and get quote unquote fired once there's no new material to voice. How long does the gig run for? If it has characters, how often does yours talk? How frequently do you book work? And would you look at that, another channel talking about something strangely specific in relation to anime, and they're our final channel for this section. Well, it's Ray Mona, who makes extensive documentaries about lost media like the live-action Sailor Moon or the Saint Seiya cartoon. Now, I know lost media is a whole subgenre on YouTube I have yet to dive into, but even without prior experience, I can say these videos are insane in both length and production quality, presenting a good look at the full backstory behind some of these obscure pieces of media, as well as documenting Ray's search for them. You've got full interviews, tons of interesting stories, and editing worthy of being aired on television. I just can't recommend it enough. Ray Mona's The Western World of Sailor Moon in particular is something that I'd highly suggest you watch as soon as possible. If you like lost media, old 80s cartoons, or good videos, You'll like this. So here are some facts we know about Saban Moon and its relationship to the original series, along with evidence and theories that can be pulled from said information. Number 1. The Toon Makers logo and Sailor Moon prototype merch Some of you may be surprised to hear that there are a handful of remnants of Toon Makers Sailor Moon that still live on in the Deke dub. In the two-minute music video presented by Alan Hastings, we can very clearly see the familiar Sailor Moon logo from the English dub, widely known to Western audiences. Digging ourselves out of the anime hole yet again, we have a couple media channels that 
I couldn't find anywhere else to put. Like Slipmaker, who makes some of the best retrospective content on YouTube, specifically about television series, with full looks at Succession, Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones, and a ton more. I'm not someone who is into television content, as is obvious from the sheer amount of gaming and anime channels in this video, but Slipmaker just has this calming yet insightful way that they go through every series they talk about. Not only dropping a lot of decent criticism and analysis, but also just going through the show in a way that feels fun and not like they're reading off a plot synopsis on Wikipedia. I just really like Slipmaker. They're easily a top channel for rewatchability, considering I went through like four of their videos while writing this segment. However, the video I would wholeheartedly suggest is their community retrospective. Not only because I love community, but because I think it's a genuinely great discussion of the show. I always enjoy pinpointing the first time in any sitcom with a seemingly mundane premise where the characters either commit a felony or are put in mortal peril. The first felony comes courtesy of Annie in episode 2, when she chloroforms a janitor during a break-in, and the entire cast is almost killed in episode 6 when Greendale becomes the epicenter of a zombie apocalypse. A zombie apocalypse that is not another character's spec script or a dream or nothing. It's real. Yeah, season two of Community goes off the rails fast. Then we have Jay Latney, who is a super chill YouTuber talking about television shows in retrospective format, but also a bunch of other stuff. Video game atmosphere, internet memes, kinda whatever. They don't have too many videos, but I already respect their willingness to just make one on a topic they like. My favorite Jay Latney video, though, is actually the history of video game commercials. If you want television retrospective type content, they have a lot of that, but I like video games and 30 minute discussions of fun commercials. Sue me. So you see the suburban Ned Flanders looking ass family pulling up in the station wagon talking lame fucking shit, right? And then all of a sudden, God smites them, picking up their car and dropping them into a fucking A1 racing car and goddamn killing them. These people fucking die. Up next is Stoked, who talks about games and pop culture from the Y2K era. Oh, would you look at that? It's right on their bio. Stoked primarily makes these incredibly slick videos about one particular era of media, talking tons about Star Wars and old serialized sci-fi shows alongside PS1 games and retro PC gaming and a whole ton of other stuff. They've also been doing this for 11 goddamn years, which I have no words for. Uh, huge props to them. Stokes' recommended video for me is the evolution of lightsabers in Star Wars games, which is a more pointed and documentarian-esque look at the history of this iconic weapon. In the first Star Wars film in 1977, we don't really see lightsabers do all that much. I mean, yeah, we see them a lot for this dude's arm off and we see them turn an old man into gas, but that's pretty much it. And the first ever games based on Star Wars didn't really have much to go on, so they themselves reflected that more humble expression. As the filmmaking technology became more sophisticated and the world of Star Wars itself became more fleshed out, we started to see Jedi doing more interesting and more creative things. I know some of you skipped to this number. I, I know you did. You can't hide from me. Channel number 69 is someone very deserving of the placement. JC Foster takes it to the moon, who is a sketch comedy YouTuber that makes a bunch of incredibly short and sometimes surreal videos. Now you might know them as the Burger King guy, but they're much more than that, I promise. Pretty much every one of their videos is hilarious to me. Their sense of humor is so fucking sharp and their video ideas are so absurd that I have literally no idea how they come up with them. So even though I don't actually watch that much pure comedy content, I just think everything they make is great. Which is why choosing just one video to show you is gonna be difficult. Now there's a bunch of lowbrow picks I could go for here, but I'm actually gonna recommend something quite profound from JC. Uh, it's called Book with a Jump Scare in it. Channel number 70 is back to general media channels with none other than Media Processing, who just kind of makes videos analyzing whatever they want. Again, not very many videos, but none of them seem to fit into any particular category besides media analysis. Really, what I'm trying to say is they made a 22 minute long video analyzing a single 100 Gex song and it's amazing. Media has this incredibly sincere and energetic passion towards all of the subjects of their videos, where it feels like they were just compelled by an otherworldly force to talk about something on camera, as if it was bouncing around in their head and just had to be let out. My favorite video from them is Mamma Mia 2 is an absurdist masterpiece, which talks about a movie 
I didn't even know existed and breaks it down in a way that's both interesting and new and also just very, very funny. But it's not just that. This scene pulls a similar trick to the Dancing Queen scene. It uses the same camera angles over and over with such little change between each shot that it feels like a prank. From the beginning of the song, the scene goes shot, reverse shot, reverse shot, reverse shot, reverse shot, reverse shot, reverse shot, for two minutes and 30 seconds before we see any other type of shot. Another channel that just kind of does whatever that I really like is Sir Speggy. Sir Speggy, I, no clue. Get them to a thousand subscribers and I'll make an apology video where I pronounce their name right. Sir, as I'll call them, has talked a lot about video games and TV shows, reviewing them and talking about why you should watch or play them. But they also have videos on just the entirety of the VHS platform or graphics. Look, I'm not gonna be the one to tie them down. Everything they make is relatively short and gives a good balance of information and Sir's opinions, where you can just hear them break down and discuss a bunch of various topics. It's all edited well and shows off some nice style. I can easily see them going places. So while their videos on TV and random stuff are very fun, the one I'll recommend is Video Game Fatigue, because obviously. It's a nice little look at feeling overwhelmed by video games, and it's only six minutes, so you have literally no reason not to watch it. Turnip Boy Commits Tax Evasion is like a good episode of a comedy. It's an onslaught of jokes, held together by interesting and funny characters, and it never gets boring. It's only around three hours long depending on if you go for 100%, which means that even though everything surrounding the story isn't super in-depth, it manages to avoid criticism because it's so short that it never gets old. And after beating Elden Ring three times, beating Sekiro twice, playing through Dark Souls, and sinking countless hours into a basketball game, this was an extremely refreshing experience. And our next few channels, are uh, kind of a gradient. This categorization thing is falling apart in real time, so I'm just lumping a bunch of people who have talked about more serious or personal issues together, and then a bunch of gamers. And we're gonna slowly transition from one to the other. Anyways, The Leftist Cooks makes feature-length video essays about sex, postmodernism, and capitalism. All the fun, family-friendly topics you're probably not gonna get from a Mr. Beast video. Delivering a ton of well-researched, nuanced points about these complex topics, with citation pages longer than some YouTubers' entire scripts. But that isn't to say there's some dry academia content that should only be enjoyed if you're one of those weirdos that highlights sections of books you're reading. There is a good amount of comedy in here. There's emotion. There's soul. You can really tell that they care about these issues they're presenting, and one of the reasons I'd even suggest you watch them is because of the charisma of their delivery, rather than just the points they're delivering. The best video I've seen from the leftist cooks, however, is somewhat ironically, this is not a video essay, which touches on the very nature of creating the kind of content that they do, and was so personal and emotional that I actually cried at the end. It's interesting to uh, read about the origins of Discordianism. It was all very silly and incredibly juvenile, but probably in quite an innovative and Dada-esque way for the early 1960s. They have all these ridiculous names and ideas like the Pentabarf and the Book of Uterus or Operation Mindfuck or Malaclips the Younger, Omnibenevolent Polyfather of Virginity and Gold. But the most interesting thing is that in spite of that, it very occasionally approaches being profound. Kiko Cat is a channel name I would have absolutely mispronounced if they had not opened a video by saying it, and a name I am still somehow probably mispronouncing. They make pretty deep videos about various pieces of media, typically anime related, dissecting the themes and larger topics in an often very personal and vulnerable way. They do seem to focus primarily on media analysis as far as video topics go, but the thing about Keiko that stands out to me is the sheer openness that they have in some of their videos. The way they just share ideas and tell stories that are so emotionally charged and resonant and relatable that I can't imagine how they just put that out on the internet. Which all sort of comes to a head in the one singular video of Keiko Cats that locked their spot on this list. The Incel to Trans Pipeline and Inside Mari, a manga analysis video that ties in the central themes of Inside Mari to this connection between incels and becoming trans, as well as Keiko's own upbringing. This video blew me away. The second half in particular elevated it from great video essay to one of the best things I've ever seen, period. I'll admit it, I cried, which is not gonna be a pattern or anything, just these last two videos. Go watch it. Each sentence starts with the same level of nihilism, anger, and despair you would expect from an incel writer, which then bloom into sweet, adorable depictions of joy in a way that's invented a new form of comedy for me. 
During this time, my emotions were becoming far more intense. I would cry at stupid and random stuff, but crying does not feel bad. It feels good and releases emotions. I would care about stuff that didn't even matter. It was almost like hormones were dumbing me down. Dumbing me down enough to where I could enjoy life. I was starting to get a feeling almost Two like artists I'm explain, or EXP Lane, make videos about art. They explain it, if you will. But more specifically, they relate artistic ideas to popular media like video games and anime, discussing various art theories and styles in an attempt to deepen our understanding of them. They've talked about manga and the progression of the medium, they've discussed how people make art in Grand Theft Auto, they have a whole video about how Van Gogh was a weeb. It's beautiful. You can not care about art whatsoever and still find some interesting points and fun discussions from their videos. And if you do care about art, or manga or video games, well then I'd say you have to check them out. My recommendation to start with is the Art of Traveling Far Away Road Trip Video Games, which goes over how video games tackle the road trip story and all the nuance that comes with that. Seekers hit the road because they have a specific mission or questions that need answers that are found elsewhere. They're looking for something in a literal or figurative sense, and their trip ends when they find it, or when they realize they never will find it. In terms of the literary canon, this type of road tripper is inspired by Walt Whitman, Jack Kerouac, and of course, Emerson. They also ask questions about the nature of relating to other people that they cross paths with. If you want more video game focused content though, Transparency has a bunch of videos analyzing and discussing different titles. Also, like movies and stuff, but you know. Their videos are extensive dives into the media they talk about, breaking down the narratives and themes within, and usually finding their own reading to interpret. Transparency just has a really solid ability to break down the art form. The points that they bring up and how they explain them is all thought out and nuanced in a way that few video essayists can manage. To the point that they've made several meta videos about game reviews or video essays in general, commenting on a lot of the common pitfalls of the space. The first video I think you should watch from Transparency is Understanding Celeste, a reading of a masterpiece, which looks at all the different themes and allegorical elements of the game to find an interpretation that I think beautifully elevates it. The wind is constantly working against you, making progress slow and the jumps more difficult. You might even start feeling like if the wind would go away, things could be easier. Perhaps you'd be able to do this a lot quicker. And at about the point where you've had it with this force 10 gale, the wind turns. It helps you. You've mastered nature, and now you're ready to take on the fight for real. Going from one gamer to another, we have Evelyn Red, who talks more about video games and their various elements in an analytical manner. Though with a much stronger focus on some very specific titles, whatever you do, do not follow them on Twitter. Oh my God, I've had to mute so many words because of them. Worst mistake of my life. If you like the very specific category of games that Corpse Party and the Caligula effect take up, then Evelyn discusses and dissects those games very thoroughly, either for the purpose of reviewing and or recommending or to analyze what makes them tick. Anyways, my recommended video for them is none of that. It's how Blahaj became an internet icon, Blahaj Explained. Honestly, just because Blahaj Explained is funny to me, but also because I like their look at the history of this niche Ikea staple. Let us first begin with the review. The product description reads, big and safe to have by your side if you want to discover the world below the surface of the ocean. The blue shark can swim very far, dive really deep, and hear noises from almost 250 meters away. Interesting, let's test that. Blohai, you're jawsome. I'm not sure if you heard it. Going all in on games content then, we have Moon Channel, who goes in depth exploring various game related topics and histories. As far as I'm aware, Moon is a lawyer, so a lot of their expertise comes in the form of stuff like the legality of video game emulators, or mods, or why Mother 3 will never be localized. And all of those topics are incredibly interesting on their own and would make up a really fun channel, but Moon then goes even further into almost 
philosophical topics like why do you always kill gods in JRPGs, where they thoroughly examine and analyze the history of the subject in a really engaging way. Though, while that JRPG video is great, I'd actually start you off with why is Nintendo so overprotective of its intellectual property? Because it's a fair bit shorter and the fun exploration of Nintendo IP law should get you familiar with Moon's stuff. As a lawyer with some, let's say, professional interest in corporate law and intellectual property, Nintendo's decision making has never been a surprise to me. I may not agree with their decision making as a fan, but in its context, both legally and psychologically, it all makes sense to me as a lawyer. I'm also of the opinion that Nintendo will become less overprotective as time goes on as a consequence of older, less legally savvy leadership leaving the company. We'll explore that theory towards the end of the video. Going from legal expertise to UX, per tease, we have Afterthoughts. Their big focus has been on UX and UI in games, with some fantastic videos about Breath of the Wild's various systems in particular. But the other content they have, talking about movies and writing and other stuff, is just as entertaining, and a pretty big bulk of their catalog. In particular, I'm a really big fan of their presentation and delivery. In a lot of their videos, they take a fun and lighthearted approach to the subject, with little animatics and neat visuals, sometimes even incorporating some unique live-action components and really nice uses of music and title cards and such. Afterthoughts is a creator that you can feel a lot of creativity from, which translates into all these different ideas for videos and the style of videos themselves. My favorite, and my recommendation then, is World of Warcraft and the joy of doing nothing which is this very cozy look at downtime in games and how waiting or just existing in a world can be fun in its own right. And sometimes I just want something low stakes and predictable and repetitive after a stressful creative day or a successful creative day or a difficult conversation or after making a tough choice or debugging some code that stumped me for hours. Sometimes I specifically crave something that will demand of me and challenge me. And sometimes I specifically crave something that won't. Sometimes my favorite moments in a game are when I'm not doing anything at all. So Doplex is a channel that makes these surprisingly high production videos about a bunch of stuff, but kind of gaming a bit. Sometimes they like to talk about lost media and obscure bits of history, but also just a bunch of really strange random topics aside from that. And all of those random topics are held together with this really slick and professional presentation. You wouldn't be surprised to find out Doplex is an editor for cold ones because just watching one of their videos, you'd think they had a million subs already. That combined with their relaxed discussion of some pretty out there stuff makes for some very watchable and rewatchable content in my opinion. The video I'd say you should start with is how how one boy was responsible for the M rating, which goes over the ESRB and its history in a really fun way. So he's overwhelmed with excitement. He jumps up, he runs to his dad and asks him if he could buy him the video game he just saw on TV. His dad agreed, but after looking deeper into this mystery game, he was horrified to find torn spinal cords, speared chests, and mangled organs, all with realistic digitized graphics. And uh, yeah, he was mad. This is how one son's request enraged politicians, put Nintendo and Sega on trial, and forged the rating system that we still use till this very day. Always Bet on Dunk is another video game focused channel, who just so happens to make a lot of videos with nothing to do with gaming. Videos with a particular focus on, I guess like cultural critique, politically related messaging. I don't know, we're deep into this video and my brain is shutting off, but there's something there. A lot of Dunk's videos will look at games or movies or other media in a comedic guy in front of a green screen style, with a lot of genuinely funny and typically very dry jokes, which are all right up my alley. But something that made them stand out to me is their tendency to add a lot of broader commentary about the subjects they're talking about, something you might be familiar with if you've seen some of the videos that I've made. For example, my recommended video from them is the very subtly titled, You Should Pirate Video Games. <laughs> Do I even need to explain what that's about? I, I think you get it. Software piracy is a crime. If little Timmy wants to download PowerPoint 2006 and doesn't pay for it, he will need to be gunned down in the street like the dog that he is. Despite the title, this video will not be a guide on how or where to pirate video games. Treat this video as a hypothetical. If you want some more nuanced video titles, well then I'd have to recommend Rosenkreutz. 
Thank you for literally putting a pronunciation guide in your channel banner, by the way. With such amazing video titles as Hobby Lobby and The Looting of Iraq and Who Put the Earth in Turf, Rosenkreutz focuses a lot on kind of fusing broader social commentary and political ideas with some video game content. They have a very captivating way of going through their topics, reminding me a lot of much larger YouTubers in the sort of deliberate way that they talk about everything, and what they talk about is very engaging to me as I'm equally fascinated by their commentary on video games as I am with their discussions of some very serious stuff. My favorite video of theirs though is how Age of Mythology plays with language, which goes over how the Age of Mythology series basically just made up a bunch of the different languages the factions speak. It's great. Now, Egyptian stands out from the trio. There is not as comfortable a direct descendant language. The closest we have is Coptic, but as we'll see, that's not exactly an accessible option. As for speaking the ancient version directly, well, we aren't sure how pronunciation worked yet, and only certain reconstructions are far enough along to be usable, and I don't think anyone would call them authentic at this stage. But video game devs aren't going to wait around for the academic community to have a more totalizing grasp on Egyptian phonetics in order to make a game, you know? Bedsheet Ghost, I honestly cannot nail down into any particular category other than quick, funny videos about internet stuff. They've talked about various games and a ton of Roblox, but also weird YouTube history like the lore of Brandon Rogers or Corey X Kenshin. I typically avoid internet-based video essay channels like The Plague since they tend to just turn into Sunny V2, but hey, Bedsheet Ghost hates those kind of videos too. Really, what they make and talk about is pretty varied and super fun, I've got no other words to describe it. The first video from them I'd say you should check out is Was Old YouTube Really Better? It talks about Filthy Frank and Smosh and stuff, what's not to love? Ask yourself this, what was the golden era of YouTube? Depending on your tastes or even perhaps your age, it could literally be any time period. It's an impossible question to answer, and going through every single major trend in YouTube's lifespan would take a crazy amount of time. Some people may answer that the very beginning of YouTube's life was the best time, the time that showed the birth of things like the viral video. Others may say that Minecraft and the inception of the Let's Play was the best time, and yet others still may say that it's right now. The fact is- All right, now before we get to the end, we've actually got a trio of YouTubers I want to show you. Starting off with none other than Colleen's Manga Rex, someone who makes regular videos about different shoujo-related manga and other media recommending series and talking about the broader culture surrounding it all. In a medium that seems so dominated by shonen and the dudes who like it online, I think that Colleen's focus on the other side of Japanese media is a much needed breath of fresh air. I'm not gonna lie and say that I watch a ton of shoujo, jose, or even manga related content, as you can clearly see from the demographics of this video, but it's for that exact reason that I enjoy Colleen's content and want to see them grow. Because just on their own, Colleen's videos are great. Super easy to get into, both informative and entertaining, serious when they need to be, they really put a lot of effort into showcasing everything they talk about. And as such, the video I'd suggest you watch first is What is Shoujo Manga? Because obviously, it's a great introduction to the topic. So yeah, that's really all what Shoujo Manga is. It's just a demographic that's marketed towards girls. All right, thanks for watching the video, guys. If you liked this one, go ahead. But wait, hold on. How do we distinguish whether a series is a shoujo or not? Why are so many people thinking that Horimiya is a shoujo and that Natsume's Book of Friends is a shonen? Well, obviously, a lot of this boils down to the stereotypes that people have in their heads about what the demographics are. Up next, then, is Lines in Motion, who also talks a ton about manga and related media, except instead of a more relaxed discussion, their videos take the form of some of the most beautiful-looking video essays on the platform. Like, the name Lines in Motion is no joke because they just straight up animate manga panels like nobody's business. Breaking down the themes, ideas, and artistry of various series, Lines videos have gone through some seriously popular and underrated works, showing off the strengths of whatever piece of media they're talking about by rendering these immaculate visuals for each one. They just have this distinct positivity that I don't see nearly enough of on YouTube. You can feel their passion for the medium shine through, it is amazing to watch. The video I'd recommend you check out from them is Delicious in Dungeon, Fundamentals of Character Design. Not only because Dungeon Meshi is getting an anime, but because the way they highlight their love of it and what it does well is supremely engaging. What can you learn from character design? 
Often when depicting the essence of storytelling, most refer to the narrative or world building at large, listing character dynamics, plot driven motives, environments or plot twists as elements that drive and progress a story forward. Character design is more often overlooked, despite being the undervalued treasure towards finessing the potential of storytelling. And the last channel of this trio is Whimsy Dearest, who makes manga, anime, and book related content. Mostly focusing on recommendations, reviews, and the occasional video essay, they cover so many different series and stories, quickly bringing you up to speed on them, telling you what they're about and what they liked, or just generally breaking them down. And I do mean quickly, because most of Whimsy's videos are less than 10 minutes, some of them even hovering around the 2 minute mark. They tell you everything you need to know and don't leave any filler, which to me makes them great for finding new stuff to read and watch. And that's not even mentioning the quality of commentary they deliver and the enjoyability of the videos on their own. One I'd suggest you check out is actually an older video, but one that I still love, Blue Period, Why We Create Art. It's a great look at the series, and it's only four minutes long. Why do we create art? Is it so we can better understand the world? So we can connect with others? So we can feel alive? Or so we can bring the wildest figments of our imagination to life? Well, depending on who you ask, that answer will vary, and Blue Period by Tsubasa Yamaguchi seeks to give various art club students answers to that question. Moving on to another small group of channels that I didn't have anywhere else to put, we have Kyle Merriman, a DIY channel that makes a bunch of nerdy video game and anime related builds. Kyle is a seriously talented woodworker who's made stuff like a working poke flute and a real metal zangetsu, just a lot of very fun projects that they take you through step by step in a really entertaining way. The energy of these videos is unmatched to me, it's a testament to Kyle's charisma and editing that I've watched their videos so many times, they just fly by like it's nothing. Though a part of that is because they're typically pretty short. Honestly, I'd watch 5 hours of woodworking tutorial from this man if he made that though. My absolute favorite from their catalog would have to be How I Made the Dragon Slayer from Berserk with No Tools. I mean, they legit made a 7 foot long sword out of cardboard and dreams. It is legitimately impressive. Okay, so I've got a lot of tools here in my shop. And normally when I do a build, I realize that the strategies and the advice that I give aren't always super relevant to everybody because, well, not everybody has a bunch of tools in their shop. So today I wanted to do something totally different and build something using the simplest set of tools I possibly could. Stuff that anybody might have lying around the house. So if anybody out there is as crazy as I am and wants to follow along at home and build one of these things themselves, they actually can't. Emerald, on the other hand, doesn't make woodworking projects, but video Video games. They're a game dev whose channel focuses on making these short, quirky projects that challenge their ability and usually achieve some weird goal. Stuff like Flappy Bird in second person, or Beat Saber in PowerPoint to name a few. Emerald's content to me has a passion for the art form at its very core, where they are making these silly little demos almost entirely for the fun of it, and they just so happen to learn stuff along the way that they share with you, the viewer. Their videos are energetic and creative, and I just really like them. One to definitely check out is their current most popular video, I Made the Same Game in 8 Engines. It's pretty much exactly what it sounds like, creating a small demo game in a bunch of different engines to learn about each one. So first, we'll drop in a camera and start working on the player movement. This barrel is our player, by the way. Just like in Unity, you code scripts that you attach to your in-game objects. But you have to code the scripts in C++, which is a language I don't know. So I opted to use Unreal's visual scripting system called Blueprints instead. Blueprints are like pre-made blocks of code, and you attach those to your game objects. So first, I made a blueprint for the player's movement. Then I used Unreal's built-in physics to add gravity to our ball to make it fall. Meanwhile, Sumo Stew makes documentaries about sumo wrestling and different wrestlers. They go about as in-depth as you can into this very specific sport, and despite my lack of understanding or interest in sumo before checking out their channel, after doing so, I'd say that everyone should watch them. Sumo, on its own, as it turns out, is a pretty interesting thing. It takes a lot of the interest people have in things like combat sports and adds heaps of tradition and history on top of it, 
which Sumo Stu goes through in detail with these amazingly edited and well-explained videos. I am talking full sports documentary quality here with pretty much every upload. The first one I think you should watch is What's the Big Deal About Henka? It's a pretty straightforward look at a specific controversial move, and I think if it interests you, it's a good sign to just watch everything Sumo Stu has ever made, because it's all equally as fantastic. The Henka is a dodge. Specifically in this video, we'll be talking about the controversial Henka pulled at the beginning of a bout, dodging at the Tachi line. The tachi eye is the part where the two wrestlers clash into a direct, full-on collision at the start of a sumo bout. There aren't a lot of combat sports that has this kind of powerful kickoff. Resprit is another YouTuber that makes some of the craziest videos out there. They're one part documentary, one part video essay, one part cool. I don't know, I just really like their style. Funnily enough, they started out as a Fortnite channel, but the videos that they're making now cover a wide range of topics. Crazy frog, sh movement, a bunch of stuff about melee. I mean, they made a video about pursuing YouTube where they're sitting in front of the 100 gex tree. They're so sick. I love them. All their videos are so high effort and have such nice visuals and engaging writing and pacing. They're all bangers. And their biggest banger, in my opinion, but also the opinion of like a million people, is The Player Who Broke Competitive Yo-Yo. It is an engaging documentary about this sport that I'd never even heard about, and that is up there with some of the best I've ever seen. Born in 2003, Hajime began to play yo-yo when he was just seven years old after attending a local yo-yo event. A year later, he had picked up the 3A yo-yoing style, which he used to win his first notable competition, the 2012 West Japan Yo-Yo Contest. Only two short years later, in 2014, Hajime Mira completed an incredibly prestigious Grand Slam tournament run, winning a national, multinational, and world yo-yo competition all in one year. And finally, our last big section. If you've gotten this far into what I can only assume has been over an hour of me talking about YouTubers, you probably enjoy long form content. And so what better way to cap this off than with some gaming channels that, as you're gonna see, make progressively longer and longer videos. The first of which is somewhat ironically, One Short Eye. Not just because they have short in their name, but because their main focus is speedrun documentaries. One Short Eye covers the speedrun histories of various adventure games. Stuff like King's Quest, Monkey Island, and almost everything from Sierra Online. And their videos are so well made. Everything from the narration, to the visuals, to the lack of synthwave music, it just feels very fresh and interesting to me. I have only a tangential interest in adventure titles, and yet the way Short Eye explains them and the speedruns of them is captivating. Especially their video, How Speedrunners Broke This Game in One Key Press, which covers a Kickstarter-backed Gabriel Knight game that had a particular debug option still left in the final release. Just to tell you about Short Eye's video making chops here, they interviewed the developer of the game during this video just to break down its history and the speedruns of it. Adventure game veterans Jane Jensen and Robert Holmes launched their Kickstarter campaign for a new game studio, Pinkerton Road. Jane is most well known for the Gabriel Knight series of supernatural thriller adventure games. What can you tell me about voodoo? To put it mildly, adventure game fans love Gabriel Knight. The fans were enthusiastic about the Kickstarter, but Jane didn't own the rights to Gabriel. So we now go from a channel that covers speed runs to a channel that covers a speedy runner. Sonic, they, they make a lot of Sonic videos. That is the worst joke I have ever made. Pariah695 is a gaming discussion channel that regularly talks about all sorts of stuff though primarily Sonic. Their videos have a very loose conversational feel for the most part, going through and reviewing or breaking down the gameplay of a specific game, sometimes just discussing an idea related to that game or the industry, and sometimes covering the entire story or lore of a game, or even just a specific character. I do like the amount of insight that Pariah is able to deliver in these videos. They have quite a few uploaded for how long they've been doing this, and it is impressive to me how they're able to keep putting out discussions that all seem to be fairly nuanced and level-headed. Also, their thumbnail style is top-notch, I love the consistency. However, despite the very popular Sonic stuff they've done, I am going to recommend you watch Emulating Games is Amazing and You Should Be Doing It, because I really like their take on the topic and I think they give a lot of valuable information on it. Also, I just love emulation. 
Now, this is a topic I have some personal passion for, because back in the day, I used to not play games through emulation. I would only play old games through official means, unlike the Nintendo Virtual Console or whatever other thing was available at the time. And I was perfectly content with that at the time, but eventually I did start to look into game emulation a little bit. And when I started playing games on emulation, I started to realize that, oh my god, I've been doing it wrong this entire time. Snickety Slice, instead of making a lot of Sonic-related content, makes the next best thing. Gex content. Or, well, actually, they've made exactly one video about Gex, and their whole channel is more focused on Japanese games like Persona and Nier and stuff, breaking down and analyzing different series in a sort of retrospective format. Not only does Snickety cover a pretty wide variety of games on their channel that I haven't really seen get much love elsewhere, but they also go through them in astonishing detail. Their coverage of the Persona series alone is about 11 videos deep at this point, and each video averages anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour and a half. They go through every nook and cranny that could possibly exist, giving great commentary and thoughtful analysis. Though their first video I'd suggest you watch is Obscure PS2 Games Extravaganza, which goes through a bunch of different weird PS2 titles, like a train racing game. It's very fun, and if you like it, you'll probably like Snickety Slice's whole channel. It's Extreme Express World Grand Prix, a racing game with trains. You might be wondering how a mode of transport that only ever travels along a fixed path could ever be turned into a racing game, but to this game's credit, it found a way. The main challenge comes from travelling as quickly as possible without derailing on the tight corners. Getting a bit further into the Japanese game rabbit hole, we then have Sean Shonson, who covers primarily PS1 titles, including those that are obscure and forgotten, or Japan only. Sometimes just going through every game from a specific developer's catalog. Though one of the main ways they decide what games to talk about, which I know you're going to appreciate, is with everybody's favorite method, the randomizer wheel. So let's not waste any more time, what's going to be the first of our three games? Yes, my random anime series is a complete ripoff of Sean Shonson, even though I only discovered their channel like a month ago. They pick obscure games at random, play through them, and then break them down and give commentary about them, which is obviously a fun enough premise on its own, but Sean adds a lot of character and nice analysis on top of that. Their videos are very relaxing, which is probably why they've compiled them into mega compilations that are over six hours long. Also, they have a playlist of PS1 music on their channel that is Nothing but bangers. My recommendation for them is then, of course, Obscure and Forgotten PS1 Games Volume 1, because there's no better place to start than the beginning. It's up to you if you want to watch this as a standalone video in a playlist or a six hour compilation, but I'm linking the standalone video, so there you go. I'll assume you're all aware of Insomniac Games. You might know them as the creators of Spyro the Dragon, Ratchet and Clank, the best Spider-Man game, Sunset Overdrive if you're cool and played that one. Well, Disruptor is the first game the studio ever developed. Released in 1996, here we have a console and PlayStation exclusive sci-fi FPS game, and guess what? It's actually pretty good. Disruptor feels and plays very similarly to a lot of the Doom clones available at the time. If your preferred flavor of really long video is in video essay format though, and for some reason you still haven't gotten enough Sonic, well then may I suggest Nizumi VA. They cover a bunch of different games like Undertale or Danganronpa, holistically analyzing the themes and story and all that good stuff. Also, they've talked about anime and internet culture, but this section is about game channels, so shut up. Nizumi's content is that classic sort of multi-hour long breakdown of a single game that your parents warned you about. They talk about every level and every character and every character's best friend's mom's favorite flavor of ice cream as a kid, and probably more than that, because I don't know how else you make an Ace Attorney video four hours long. Their videos aren't just length for the sake of it though, they deliver some great analysis and very enjoyable editing and commentary that all makes it worth watching. Therefore, the first video I'll link to you is completely unrelated to any of that. The German Dollhouse and Parasocial Horror is a very succinct video essay about the horrific relationship creators have with their audience. It's very fun. With the assistance and financial support of Twitch, Coinbase, and an entire crew of dedicated talent working hard to make it happen, the German 985 Dollhouse was born. Part 2. The German 985 Dollhouse is a potent metaphor for the hell of parasociality. I swear I'm going somewhere with this. The premise was admittedly rather simple. Alright, so I may have jumped into the really long content a bit quick and lost some of you there. 
Let's tone it back with a creator whose videos are only a single hour or so on average. Face Full of Eyes Face is an incredibly unique video essayist that has primarily made a series called The Aesthetics Of, where they talk about various shooters like Modern Warfare, SWAT 4, and Far Cry 2, analyzing the style and feel of the games and what they do that makes them unique. These videos don't just have an incredible amount of effort and flair put into the editing and visuals, but a style of writing that is unmatched on YouTube. Something about the way Face analyzes these topics, segueing through their different points, just captivates me. They're pretty much a master of the style of video that they make. And my favorite of theirs is actually the one that steps away from their main series and looks at a slightly different topic. That being history of handedness in video games, a nearly two hour long exploration of the way that game characters have held guns throughout the years and why that's important. This video is phenomenal, words can't do it justice. I have to single out the GTA 4 here. When you insist on an avatar being right-handed in all situations, this inevitably leads to some interesting animations. GTA 4 took consistency to another level. It featured a cover system with blind fire option as well as quite a number of weapon types. This created a lot of variety in animation. In all three stories from Liberty City, not once did they reach for the convenience of ambidexterity and mirroring. Across this system, patterns are formed, of course, but still, think about how many different weapon types, grips, modes of fire had to be accommodated. Anyways, back to the really long stuff, Ludiscary has a five and a half hour Final Fantasy IV analysis video. Happy belated Halloween, everybody, because that's terrifying. What Ludiscary makes is in the same vein as the previous long form games analysis channels I mentioned. They tend to talk about a single game for hours and hours in a video, covering pretty much everything about it that's of interest to them. However, what is of interest to them is what sets them apart, in my opinion. Ludiscary's videos have a particular focus on mythology and particular motifs across games, as illustrated by their gigantic The Mythology Behind Hades video that you've probably seen on your homepage at some point. And that passion does bleed into quite a few other videos they've made, giving them a very unique flavor. Though, again, I'm hesitant to just recommend a four hour video about a game some of you might not have even played. So to bridge the gap, I'm going to recommend their Final Fantasy 1 analysis, which is the first in a series they have and is a pretty good intro into their stuff. Also, only an hour long. So what you see on screen now, what I've just read out, is about the extent of the context you get for the story prior to starting the game. Nowadays, Final Fantasy is regarded as a pioneering series when it comes to narrative progression in games, and for good reason, but this can only really be applied to the series from Final Fantasy 4 and onwards. Final Fantasy 1 is not really a game which has the ability to fall back on its story as a safety net, because the narrative thread holding the game together is pretty thin. We'll get to that in a sec. All right, so uh, Skyhoppers makes long form video essays breaking down the themes of popular games, and also anime sometimes, which makes them different. Listen, you have no idea how hard it is to write unique descriptions of people in the same YouTube niche. I am struggling here. <laughs> Jokes aside, Sky's videos have a particular interest in the thematic and cultural strengths of certain media, often using an entire video to examine a single point related to the subject game. Why Bastion lies to you, why Final Fantasy VII isn't about the environment, why Celeste proves you can do anything, etc. They combine a very calming presentation and narration with topics and discussions that are, at their core, very engaging. And I think that this not only makes them easy to watch, but comforting and familiar if you're someone who already enjoys a lot of big game essay channels. They fit right in, so well that you'd never suspect they had under 100k subs. My recommended video from them is surprisingly not their 3 hour Final Fantasy 7 video, even though it's very good. Instead, it's the complex beauty of Super Mario Sunshine, a fun and concise piece about one of the most colorful Mario games, coming in at 32 minutes too. Go check it out. If I could only play one game for the rest of my life, it would be Super Mario Sunshine, and I'm not kidding. This 2002 GameCube title has experienced quite a roller coaster in critical reception. While it was initially praised and is currently riding an upswing in fond retrospectives due largely to the nostalgia cycle, for years and years, Sunshine was widely considered one of the, if not the, worst mainline Mario game. Looking back at the broader series, it certainly sticks out. Magular, the penultimate game channel in this section, and yes, I used that word correctly this time, 
makes retrospectives on a bunch of stuff. Xenogears, Yakuza, every RPG on the 3DO, they've talked about games both popular and bizarre, going through them in their entirety and providing really fun commentary throughout. Magellar's videos are much lighter than your typical retrospective, including a lot of commentary and chill vibes. They typically take you through their entire playthrough and experience with a game, sparing no expense to poke fun at it or explain the story and mechanics in a laid back manner. They're not trying to be overly serious, which makes their videos feel like a friend telling you about this game they just finished, just over the course of a few hours. Any of their individual game retrospectives are good to start with. However, reviewing a bunch of RPG Maker games does explore a handful of fun titles, which I think makes it a good choice for a recommendation. It's happened to me more than once. I finish a great indie game and find out months later that it was made in RPG Maker. Poppycock, I say, but I look it up and I'll be damned, made in RPG Maker. But what is RPG Maker and why is it such a momentous occasion to find a great game made with it? Well, to answer that question, we have to go back in time. 1992, in a little country known as Japan, where a publishing company, ASCII, released a program for NEC PC 9801 Japanese home computers. This software was called And last in this section, coming in at number 99 is Munt Chunk. What a name. <laughs> now I've actually been holding back with the long form channels thus far, because with a five hour Minecraft retrospective, a five hour Resident Evil retrospective, part one, and a six hour COD Zombies retrospective, I'd say MC is easily one of the best channels for pure length of content alone. They have covered many different popular games and franchises, and even albums and movies, in their entirety across videos that make this one seem like a breeze. But length isn't the only thing you get out of an MC video. On top of summary and analysis, they often provide a commentary on the importance or cultural significance of each work discussing everything around and leading up to whatever they're talking about being made, really just putting in work to earn that ultimate retrospective they put in their titles. And by far, the most ultimate retrospective they've made, and the one I'm recommending, is the ultimate Grand Theft Auto retrospective, coming in at a light and breezy 9 hours and 20 minutes. This behemoth covers every single GTA game and more, and I'm not even going to try to suggest anything else because there's no point. Watch this first, I dare you. As most of you will know, the Grand Theft Auto franchise has been solely developed and released by a company called Rockstar Games, being founded in 1987 and initially going under the name BMG Interactive. This is a company that was and still is a subsidiary of Take-Two Interactive, but it's important to note that the actual development house of these games was called DMA Design, now known as Rockstar North, a British development studio that's been the primary creators of every single mainline GTA game. Okay, finally. Channel number 100, the last creator I'll be recommending in this video. Just kidding. Something I haven't really touched on this whole time has been the giant variety of music channels on YouTube. Ones that create amazing songs in a wide variety of genres, many of which I have used in my own videos. I think it can be hard to categorize musicians the same way we do YouTubers, but they are still on YouTube, and some of them are surprisingly underrated. So I just wanted to shout out some great artists to listen to on YouTube before I finish up. Artists like Mari, Desired, and Mikazuki Big Wave, who make some of the best future funk out there and single-handedly got me into the genre. You've got Owl Vision and Irving Force putting out the hardest synth and metal music you've ever heard. There's 3D Blast with their nostalgic vaporwave music and my favorite song in recent memory, Here to Stay. Mitch Murder is one of the most consistent and creative synth artists in recent memory. They deserve all the props in the world. And Lo-Fi Leah's massive catalog of Lo-Fi video game remixes was one of the first things I ever put in the background of my stuff because I loved it so much. Though they did announce they were going on indefinite hiatus earlier this year, so I wish them all the best. And finally, for real this time, Channel number 100, Megabaz, who puts out 8-bit chiptune remixes of anime openings, video game soundtracks, and more, many of which I've put in the opening titles of earlier videos, because they are genuinely wonderful. I'd especially suggest listening to their remix of Kickback from Chainsaw Man, it is an absolute treat. 
Though my recommendation for a watch is actually their Chu Tayuse remix. I love that song so much and Megabaz absolutely does it justice. So I'll link Megabaz for this timestamp, but all of the artists mentioned and more are in that spreadsheet in the description. I highly suggest giving them all a listen, they all deserve it. And that is 100 channels that I think are underrated and underappreciated and deserve your watch time and subscriptions and likes and comments. Hopefully you found someone new to watch from this, and hopefully all the channels listed here can continue to grow and get a silver play button of their own. I think it might actually be a fun idea to check up on this video in a couple years and see where everyone is. Again, hopefully not in jail. <laughs> Anyways, if you've made it this far into the video, Oh my god, thank you. I have no idea how people are going to react to this. I mean, I was already feeling a lot of pressure writing it because I wanted to do everyone justice, but I've got no idea how well this does or what people think of it or if it's even a watchable video. That being said, even if this video bombs, I just like talking about YouTubers and I kinda already wanna do it again. This video took forever, but it was super fun to make and sharing channels like this is just not something you see a lot on YouTube anymore. So I'm definitely gonna figure out a way to do it again, maybe for another channel milestone, but if there's enough interest, maybe even sooner, I don't know. What I do know is that you should definitely check out that spreadsheet in the description because there are a bunch more creators there that make good stuff that I'm sure you'll like. Hopefully I can get around to covering them sometime in the future. Really, the only thing I want to talk about that's related to me is an announcement. A pretty huge announcement, actually. As of this video, I have gotten my first official channel partnership, Gamersubs. If you don't know, Gamersups is a zero sugar, zero carb, less than one calorie energy drink formula that isn't just healthier and cheaper than canned energy drinks and sodas, but in my opinion, way tastier. How do I know this? Because I've literally been drinking it this entire video. <laughs> I've been recording for like six hours now, and the only thing that has gotten me through it has been gamer subs. In fact, it's pretty much all I drank while writing and editing this thing too. It's very good. The Blowhole Blast flavor in particular is my favorite. And you might be thinking, Blowhole Blast? That's a weird name for a flavor. Nope, <laughs> not even close. Titty Milk, Anime Girl Thigh, Grandpa's Ashes, Straight Up Fucking Lean, Guacamole Gamer Fart 9000. These are all real flavors and they are surprisingly good. I actually have that last one in caffeine free because I drink this stuff late at night a lot. So if you want to try some yourself, you can use my brand new promo code LEXTORIUS or visit gamersups.gg slash LEXTORIUS linked in the description to get 10% off your order. And if you're watching this video the day it comes out, Gamersups is actually giving away free samples for 48 hours for anyone who wants one. And like actually free. You don't even need a credit card or payment method. They just send it to you, no questions asked. Well, except for your shipping address, I guess. I guess they would ask that. You get what I mean. Big thanks to Gamersubs for partnering with me. You're gonna be hearing a lot about them going forward. I cannot stress enough that I just really like their product. I actually genuinely like drinking this stuff. It's very tasty. Anyways, thank you everyone for watching. Sorry for the long wait on this one. I'm working on way more videos now, so things should be in full swing going forward. I hope you're all doing well, and I'll see you next time.